Welcome, action fans, and thanks for joining us for another edition of All 90s Action All the Time as we continue our journey through the 90s filmography of Kurt Russell. I'm one of your hosts, Scott Murphy, and on today's podcast, we're going to be talking about 1993's Tombstone. And who do I mean by we? Well, of course, I mean my regular co-host who is back after his one-week break from the show. It is screenwriter, one-third of Bloodhound Picks, and the hardest-drinking gunslinger in all of Michigan. It's Mr. Craig Draheim. I'm your huckleberry. I knew I knew you were going to pick that one. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not all, as we also have a very special guest in the form of the One Pound Movie Podcast host, Mr. Wayne Saunders. Hi, Wayne. Hello, hello. Totally stole my thunder there, Craig. I was going to use exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about finding a different one, but I was, I was going quickly going through all my notes. Like, okay, which one? Which one actually works with it? <laughs> yeah, the, I, I'm your Huckleberry is the one that just like fits in the, the most. But then, I mean, like it does just make it sound like you're both wanting to get into a fight with me, which is. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to. I'm a lover and not a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good to know. Good to know. Um, so a little bit of background detail as always. Tombstone was released on Christmas Day in 1993. And now normally I would say who directed the film. Um, but it's going to be easier to first say who wrote the film. So the film was written by the late Kevin Jar, who also his notable credits include uh, The Lights of Glory, uh, The Devil's Own, and Judgment Night. Uh, the film was also originally going to be directed uh, by Mr. Jar, but he was fired after a month of filming as the, the film just went way behind schedule and apparently he pissed everybody off uh, because he was sticking far too rigidly um, to his uh, script, uh, which was, uh, according to most people, uh, somewhat overlong and Yes, it, it just it just wasn't going going well, and also he wanted to shoot entirely in order and have all the same pacing as a nineteen forties western. It just there was a lot of clashing of heads, uh, so he was replaced by the late George Cosmatos, um, whose most notable credits include the likes of Rambo: First Blood Part Two and Cobra. However, while he is the credited director. On the film, it turns out, like, after his death, it came about that uh, really Kurt Russell did a lot of the directing and gave Cosmetos uh, a shot list each morning um, before going on to set. So he was the kind of secret director. And this has been backed up by other sources, including uh, Val Kilmer. So it's very complicated. Uh, review wise, uh, Tombstone is currently sitting on a 7.8 out of 10 on IMDb, which is the highest IMDb rating of any film we have covered so far on the show <laughs> and will probably be the highest for a while. <laughs> it is uh, 74% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 46 reviews. It is 50 on Metacritic based on 22 reviews and it has a 3.8 on Letterbox. Finally, box office wise, it made $56.5 million off of a $25 million budget which is pretty solid, but not amazing. However, it was a much, much bigger hit on VHS and has grown into a real kind of cult classic over the years, and some even consider it one of the best Westerns ever made. So, uh, we'll go to you first, Wayne. What is your relationship to Tombstone? Uh, right, okay, so uh, I saw this, I think it would be about 1996 would be the first time I saw this. I was 13 when this came out, so 1993. 96 was the first time I saw this. I saw it around a friend's house, and I'm so old that we still had video shops, VHS video shops, <laughs> back in 1996. And we rented it from, uh, it's called Bill's, that's what the video shop was called, I remember it. And we watched it, and I think we watched it like three times over that weekend. And then the, the friend in question just went 
bananas and every time I saw him we ended up watching Tombstone so <laughs> and he like watched it constantly it, it was one it's his favorite film easily um so that's sort of my relationship I, I, I loved it from the first time I saw it I think it's a great film and uh yourself Craig yeah so you know we were kind of mentioning it before so Tombstone over here I can't remember the first time I watched it but I know I think it was right after it came out on VHS my dad must have rented it for my grandfather who was a big western fan or whatever which you know if you're it was one of those things if you're a man in the united states <laughs> for a period of time it's like you had to love western it's, it's a, that's you know, that's not a night that's not a united states thing that's that's oh, like yeah. a global thing i feel that is oh, okay. well, my grandma was exactly the same so. yeah it's just <laughs> this love of westerns and um, i feel like over here when the, the, the war movie is more war movies and westerns no uh, it, I suppose it depends because my granddad was, uh, he was 86, like, when he died, which was like 15, 16 years ago. Uh -huh. So I think he sort of grew up with the westerns rather than the war films. But yeah, I, either way, it, it, any genre that begins with the W, your granddad <laughs> loves it. <laughs> yeah. Fair, yeah. fair point, fair point. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Oh, Craig. no, no, <laughs> no, I'm glad because that stuff, um, I kind of talked about again before we started recording, but I wanted to hear more. I really wanted to hear from both of your perspectives on it because I, we, I saw it and Tombstone is just one of those movies that it's like, you know, a big, huge classic over here that um, I was saying that any pretty much it's probably on TV right now. Any at any point you could probably find Tombstone <laughs> playing somewhere on television and it's just constant. And, you know, the I'm your Huckleberry is, you know, a big line. And yeah, so I've seen it. I, I mean, I own it. I don't even know how many times I've seen it now, but I've either seen it in its entirety or, you know, at least caught mm. clips of it on television, at least uh, tons of tons of times throughout the years. And I even probably watched it a few months ago in that same way. But <laughs> yeah, it was interesting going on to it now because I used to, I mean, I love it. I still love um, Val Kilmer in it. But for the sake of this podcast where we're kind of going these scene by scenes, I could see some issues and um, there are points for me that it started to feel, you know, it, it dives into that melodrama a lot that there was, especially with the romantic relationship and stuff like that, <laughs> but uh, which we'll get into, but yeah. I need to backtrack. I said, great film. It's not, it's <laughs> yeah. got flaws. So let's be honest. Yeah. It's got flaws. <laughs> no. But I think, yeah, definitely. But I agree with you, Wayne, though. I, definitely watching it for the sake, I think, of entertainment or like if we were just sitting at home watching it by ourselves, it's, you know, it's really fun and it's entertaining. It's great. And that's it. But yeah, going, I think, for the sake of this, of like the scene by scene kind of element, uh, just like with Copland or other ones that we've had in this um, series, you know, little things start coming to the surface when you have to really sit down and write notes on it. Yeah. I think like one of the, actually, you know, talking about the film's reputation, I think one of the things that most surprised me um, when kind of researching the film was that I had it in my head that most people thought of this as a classic. And then so it surprised me that the reviews at the time were good, but not great. Because yeah. I thought it was just kind of immediately like, you know, it was seen as one of those best westerns of the 90s, you know, kind of tied with Unforgiven, that kind of thing. But like, the reviews seemed to be like solidly thumbs up, but like more in the kind of three star kind of bracket, I, I would say, some four stars, but not like, um, not a lot of kind of like, this is great, like five stars. Yeah. It's just a funny one, really, because obviously you just mentioned Unforgiven, and, and this is surfing that entire, you know, you, you get somebody like Clint Eastwood behind the, the lens filming un, un, Unforgiven, which is this completely anti hero Western film. And mm. then off the back of that, you know, Kevin Jarr, like you say, and Kurt Russell and all the cast, they go and make a traditional Western off the back of this. And I think that's sort of, where it becomes where the classic element comes into it because it's it is going to an original sort of this is a film you could have gone and took your granddad to see yeah get the pictures you could have shared that you know shared experience with them in the cinema and i think that's it's almost like a future nostalgia for it you know it's it's a it's a a film that's 
I mean, it's a modern classic, I suppose, a modern yeah. Western classic, even though it's not set up to date. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there are so many moments, especially, I, I, and it's in my notes, up until, I don't even know the time, I left, lost track of the time for it, but the whole first, I'd say, 30 minutes feel very much like a old school Western, especially how they talk and they're like, you know, it's kind of this element of, oh, sh- oh, there goes Wyatt doing that crazy thing. And, you know, and they're like, and they're doing that tableau in the mirror, then the window. Like, and it feels very, um, traditional, like pre, um, spaghetti western and the yeah, anti western I mean, period. If you go in that, sorry, great. If you go in that, no, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. I mean, like the music as well. They're, yeah. You know, they're invoking a John, John Ford esque, you know, soundscape with, with that sort of, massive uh bernard herman type score you know that, that invokes you know the planes and that sort of thing mm-hmm. they could have easily gone for something a bit more low-key or you know for like it, it was never going to be that was it with a 20 million <laughs> budget for a, a western it was always going to be something a bit more um out the box think or in the box thinking as it were yeah <laughs> yeah just i mean just going back to what you're saying about uh george i think is it uh, cosmatos is cosmatos it, is, yeah um obviously his son is Paco, uh, is it Cosmatos or Cosmatos? Either way. Um, he's the guy who directed Mandy with Nicolas Cage. I don't know if you've seen mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned that he did Cobra and what was the other film? First, uh, Rambo First Blood Part 2. So this guy is 100% a canon journeyman. So he's, yeah. he's a Golan and Globus stooge, isn't he? So he's yeah. obviously been, he's been drafted in and then it's like, you can just sit back and I'll do all the work and we'll give you the credit for it. And he's going, yeah, sound. Sorted. <laughs> no worries. No, got my name on a 20 million pound budget. Happy days. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, like, um, I, I'm, I'm now not sure about my plans. I think it's uh, just, just do it. Don't uh, but. Yes, um, but yes, it, like um, there is a connection here as well because we, you you mentioned the director of Manny, Mandy, uh, Panos Cosmos. Uh, the funny thing about his career is that the royalties that his father George got from this movie he put into his first movie uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow, oh, yeah. and um, that's that's how we got that film from this film. That's oh, wow. crazy. That's, well, that's brilliant as well at the same yeah. time. That's excellent. And I think, like, I, of the three of us, have the least relationship to this film because I've only, I had only seen it once before, um, in my mid-teens and then I'm seeing it again today. And, like, yeah, I think it's a good film, but I don't think it's a great film. And I think a part of that for me is I'm not a huge Western fan. Yeah. I do like spaghetti westerns and I do like uh, revisionist westerns, but I'm not a huge traditional western fan. So that you know that is, and I think part of my thing as well is it's trying to do a like if it was purely just doing its own thing and just being like, oh, well, we're a traditionalist western, like that's fine. But there is elements where you're kind of like. It's trying to have its cake and eat it. It's trying to be a super entertaining film and kind of a serious film. And it's trying to be like a traditionalist Western, but with some kind of revisionist side notes, yeah. which I don't think entirely works. Although I will say, I do still think it's a very good movie and I still think it's a, a very entertaining movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can tell, I guess, watching it that because I mean, we'll go and talk about how so much got cut from the script and you've already mentioned it, Scott, but um, you can kind of tell there's elements within it because I know even my, my father, he was reading a white, he read it some wider book and um, there's moments where it talks about that before the elements of tombstone or whatever, you know, wider over here, at least. And, you know, in this movie is seen as this, amazing lawman like this the hero's hero type of thing kind of you find out that before any of that he was like he's like he wasn't really you know that great hero that he was made out to be when after that or before that point point. Mm-hmm. and so i get and i know it's, it's hinted at in this movie but it's never expanded upon of him being you know kind of talking about the conscience thing or yeah that he already he kind of has all this guilt and that, you know, I don't know, fire or killing a man or stuff like that and kind of these elements. But then 
it never really explores it, I guess, to the point that then it tries to. Yeah, there I can get what you're saying, Scott, where there's moments where it's like trying to go in that down that rabbit hole, I guess, but then not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I suppose, um, as, as always, we, we actually, to be fair, we stayed relatively disciplined because usually we go oh, yeah. on a tangent and then talk about the plot of the movie. Yes. We are still talking about the film we're talking about. So that, that is still showing a level of yes. discipline, but we are a little bit in and we've not started, um, talking about the plot of the movie yet. So we should probably do that. Let's so, do <laughs> um, I think, um, like since you're the special guest, Wayne, you can kick us off and tell us how Tombstone starts. I, I wasn't expecting this. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'll go for it. Uh, it opens with uh, a monologue uh, about the Old West, um, about um, how everything's been going, you know, how it's uh, found itself in the middle of this um, sort of coming to the end and it's fighting against leaving the Old West behind. And then we meet our gang and we find ourselves uh, in Arizona. Um, <clears throat> and they use this uh, this great shot from... The Great Train Robbery, yep. um, which is obviously 19, it's, it's credited as the first ever Western film ever made from 1903, which is nine minutes long and it's on YouTube. And if you're a film buff and you haven't seen it, it's nine minutes of your life and it's brilliant. Give it a watch. Um, and they uh, explain about the red sashes and that's how cowboys identify themselves. And they're sort of like the first organized crime gang, as it were. They're the, they're the original mafia in, in the Old West, as it were. Do you want me to carry on? or? Yeah. You want to take over? Okay. Uh, yeah, Craig, do you want to uh, go go for go for next? Yeah. What happens after we get the introductory monologue, um, which is done by um, Robert Mitchum, who yeah, yeah. was supposed to have a role in the movie, but like due to ill health, I think um, didn't didn't have an on screen role in the movie. But he was supposed to appear as Old Man Clanton, but he didn't. Okay. But he does get to narrate both the start and the end of the movie. Um, yeah. But Back to you, Craig. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of, because it's a Western and I don't know why this is a common trope, you see <laughs> um, a Mexican wedding is about to occur and the cowboys basically ride in and they, because of the fact that the the police killed two of their men, they decide to shoot up the whole town, killing you know everybody and then even killing the the groom because he wouldn't, you know, get down on his knees and he wouldn't surrender to them. And then it's assumed that they then do something to his new bride. Rough that, really rough. Yeah. Found that really, really rough in the first yeah. seven minutes of the film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so they, then the, the pre, well, so during this whole thing, you kind of, and there are also, also like, um, I, I did want to mention as yeah. well, like, and this uh, goes to something that happens in the plot later, but everybody else is, is fine with this bride being dragged into the church for, you know, presumably, uh, not a fun time. And, uh, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, it was just it was a very diplomatic way of saying um, rape. <laughs> yes, like I, I it wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't sure to, like whether to say that or not. But yes, that that is that is implied what is going to happen. Yes. Um, she is going to be raped. I never really fine with that, apart from Michael Rooker's character Sherman McMaster, who is. Uh, he's fine with it enough that he doesn't stop anything, uh, but pulls a funny face as if to say, "Well, yeah. that's a bit distasteful." And that's the thing. So Michael Rooker, and I know we'll talk about it, I mean, when he comes up again, but where the script, I feel like there were so many other subplots because he's there. You see his face do that. No lines. And it's not until like an hour later that or more that he pops up again. It's like, oh, I don't believe in what they're doing anymore. Like, oh, yeah, you were there. <laughs> You're in this movie. <laughs> but that's how you look at a lot. You had um, Thomas Hayden church you had michael rooker you have um i can't think of the actor's name but i know he was in what six in the city or um my big fat greek wedding or he's been a ton of stuff um your powers booth there's a there's Everybody's actually a nice. yeah. yeah there's a huge cast in this oh movie. it's a crazy cast yeah yeah michael yeah. bine as well of course yeah. is it bine bine bean why the hell did you say bean i think michael yeah. bean uh, yeah. S- Stephen lang <laughs> yeah Ah, oh, uh, what a piece of shit Stephen Lang is. <laughs> I'm going to say that every time you mention his name. What a piece ah. of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and 
so in this whole thing, what I, a scene that I really like, and again, it's only really expanded upon at the very end duel, but you see when they're shooting all of the, the policemen and they're kind of all enjoying themselves, that Ringo, who's supposed to be this, the fastest guy in the West, you kind of see this nervousness and this terror in his eyes of like, he doesn't know what to do and he's kind of frightened about it, but you know, they lose that again until the very end where he's fighting Doc Holliday. Um, but yeah, it becomes this, you get that. And the only person he's willing to kill is the priest hmm. who is basically saying that, you know, they're going to get their judgment and quoting the Bible revelations of, you know, the man with no name riding a pale horse and bringing all hell with it or whatever, however the phrase goes for people that I guess they're religious. I'm not. So I only know from the movie perspective of how it's quoted, but yep. Um, I wonder if that's um, I wonder if that's a, a sly way of quoting um, Sergio Leone's um, The Man With No Name uh, trilogy. You know, oh yeah, no, no name man riding a pile of horse. I wonder if that's a sly way of doing that. Yeah, yeah, it could very well be. There's a lot of like Western references in the yeah. in the movie, yeah, yeah. so like, yeah, I, I that's, that's probably a good catch there, Wayne. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, so they basically they slaughter up this town. He kills the priest. He says the meaning of what was being said and then that's when you get to and the very big exposition of because throughout this movie everybody talks about if you cut out all the scenes of them talking about Wyatt Earp you'd get like 30 minutes less <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah it's basically all a lead up to they're going to face retribution by one man and then we go into yeah. the train pulls up and who steps out but Wyatt Earp. I love the cut though. I love I love the edit here where he's yeah. talking about you know um, death riding on a pale horse kind of stuff, and then immediately cuts to Kurt Russell's face, and you're like, ah, yeah. oh, good times. <laughs> Slapping a man because he was hitting his horse. Well, that's that. yeah, just this is the thing because like <laughs> later on in the movie they try and do this thing where it's like, ah, oh, you know, like um, is who's who's really the bad guys here? You know, like, um, yeah. the, you know, the, the Erps and the Clantons, they're really just mirror images of each other. But at the start of the movie, you have like the Clantons being evil douchebags. Yeah. And then like immediately we're introduced to White Earp and within two seconds, he has the save the cat moment of like slapping a guy who mistreats a horse and then taking that horse away and being like, yeah, cause White Earp doesn't stand for animal cruelty. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's, I, I agree with that because there's that, there's that point after they kill those men. Um, and we'll get into it obviously after the okay corral, and you're supposed to feel like, oh, that we were wrong in killing the men. You're like, wait a minute. 40 minutes ago, you just killed a bunch of innocent <laughs> town people, raped a woman. Like, I'm not feeling bad for any of you guys in this whole dilemma here. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah. So then, yeah, we get, he comes up and he slaps the man, gets his horse. And then we get basically this kind of tableau where his family joins him and they're all, they talk and a lot of the opening is them just talking about how great it is that they're all going to be a family together and start a new life. And they have like, they stand in front of the window and look at themselves as one great family, but you're introduced to Virgil, um, to Morgan, his brothers, and then their wives. And then also, um, Wyatt Earp's wife, who is, we get the hint that she's addicted to, um, lot of them. Yeah, a lot of, but it's, it's very happy for the most part. Besides that, <laughs> <laughs> apart from the fact that, like, Wyatt's wife is probably a dope fiend. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a very diplomatic note of, uh, we see Wyatt Earp's wife has a problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, see, we're all trying to be diplomatic here. We're all trying... <laughs> <laughs> and then we get the introduction of the best character in the movie. It's Doc Holliday. Yes. And like, and, and one of our career high performances, um, from Val Kilmer, yeah. um, who's just, he's just playing a card game. The other guy's not very happy because he's losing the card game, and um, he, he mocks him and says, "Oh, he's not he's not that tough without his guns and stuff." Um, but then he puts his guns on the table, and uh, I've put my notes here. Doc just as deadly with a knife. 
just attacks that guy, stabs him. So, Doc Holliday, I, you know, I mean, I'm obviously going out on a limb and feeling biased, but I mean, his portrayal of Doc Holliday is just, it's not even a, like a career high for, um, Val Kilmer, in my opinion. I think it's one, he's one of the best, it's one of the, like, best just Western characters in his portrayal because it's so theatrical and every line he gives is just like, I don't know, the whole bit, it, it cracks you up at times, it, whatever, where, He's like saying the whole thing about, oh, well, we can't be friend- <laughs> friends anymore. I don't know what I'd think if you couldn't be my friend. And he's like saying all this stuff and the way he <laughs> delivers it. And, you know, and he's drunk basically the whole movie and dying from TB. And yeah, I mean, Tilma plays it in such a, I like, like, I agree completely. He's never been better yeah. than, than, mm-hmm. I mean, Chris Kiss Bang Bang maybe because yeah. he's brilliant in that as well. But it's one of those performances. It drags your eye to him. Doesn't matter what's going on on the screen. You're yeah. watching Doc Holliday because he's the charisma. He's the charisma of the entire film. And you'd think yeah. Kurt Russell as Wyatt Earp would be, but he's the sort of um, the moral compass of the film. Whereas Doc Holliday is very his, his compass of morality is very wayward. You know, straight, like you were saying in this scene where we first meet him, him and his uh, lady friend go and rob the saloon straight after. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he kills this guy and they rob the saloon. There's, yeah. you know, there's, there's no two ways about it. He's, he's got a moral amb- ambigu- ambiguity to him as, as Doc Holliday. And it's it's brilliant. It's so well done by, by Kilmer. Yeah, I, I like, uh, well, I wanted to pick you up, uh, Wayne, on uh, the, the, you know, I'm robbing the saloon because in my notes, I've put most chill robbery in the world because he just <laughs> yeah. slides his hand across a card table and picks up the money and just walks out. And everybody's like, oh, that dark holiday. What a waggy guy. And then <laughs> nothing happens. Yeah. I, I just assume that everybody's scared the shit out of it. You know, it's yeah, like, it's oh, true. God, he's, he's just, you know, so cool about everything. It's like, it's unpredictable, I suppose. You don't know what he's going to do next. So but, they're like, oh, yeah. screw it. It's not, it's only money. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I, the whole thing with him and Ringo. Like everybody's afraid of him because he's the only character in it that like, doesn't care if he dies, I guess, or doesn't have. So it's like, so he's un, so unpredictable that everybody's afraid of him because yeah. Yeah. yeah and also like michael bean has like crazy eyes he does great crazy eyes yeah, in this movie. He does. Well, also that... like i would also agree with you when that like it's it's closest competitors as a performance in val kilmer's filmography i would say is his performance as perry in kiss kiss bang bang yeah. or his performance yeah. as jim morrison in the doors oh yeah well, I've got no reference. I haven't seen the doors, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, and I know he's, it's, it's one of those where it's like universal across the board. Yeah, he does a fantastic, um, interpretation of, of Jim Morrison. So yeah. yeah. But if, I mean, somebody says Val Kilmer to you, what's the first thing you think of? It's, you know, it's not weird science. They're not weird, not top secret, is it? Or, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I or, do love him in top secret. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've bro, I've seen <laughs> Top Secret more than I've seen this movie. <laughs> well, would you know it's fantastic? What I'm saying, uh, I mean, when you say Val Kilmer to me, you've probably this is the film that this or Iceman in Top Gun. They're the two. Oh, yeah. That, that, All right, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, those two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he's just one of those actors, and it's a shame because I think you know, he's one where his ego got the best of him and stuff like that, and then. He was drinking, I want to say, but I don't know. He's just one of those actors where everything he's in, like you can't deny, he he just takes all of the attention. He just, I mean, yeah, he's he's, he's um, just incredible. He's know. got um, old Hollywood charisma. That's what he's yeah. got. You know, speaking of old, like Robert Mitchum, you know, it's yeah. it's old Hollywood charisma. No matter what you do, you you're going to be able to get work because you have that undeniability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the only time I've seen him, he, he kind of doesn't. There's, there's only been a couple of times where I, I think he hasn't like stolen things, and it's generally when he's either in the lead or he's, he's with somebody who has equal charisma, where they're yeah. just, they're just kind of like in Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, where him and Cage are just going at it. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah God, I've seen that film once, and I, I obviously. Um wiped it from memory because I don't remember Vulcan <laughs> being in that at all. So. <laughs> yeah. Ah, we uh, roll on though. We we yeah. roll into uh, Tombstone um, yep. itself, the town of Tombstone. We get Where the we, first yeah. look at Tombstone as uh, the Erps uh, ride into town yep. and we are introduced to Sher- the county sheriff, county sheriff Behan, oh, who I, is apparently... So, sorry, sorry, Scott. Can I just pull you back one second there? Yep. So as they ride into town, they go past... Uh, it's called Bast Hill Cemetery. Did you see the um, the tombstone? Oh, 
Yeah, you, four oh. slugs from a 44, no less, no more. Oh, I absolutely love it. Yeah, here lies less than more, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had to rewind it and pause it because it was just so good. <laughs> love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, I'm, I'm glad you, you stopped the podcast for that. We definitely needed to mention that because yeah. like, yeah, that cracked me up as well. Cause I, <laughs> it was like, oh, that's a, that's a random fun shot that they've kept in there. And that's yeah. <laughs> I, it's absolutely true as well. That's that's how they used to uh, write the tombstones, you know, uh, yeah. just random sort of limerick, as it were, about you know, these people die. I also think it may be a tip of the hat to um, Blazing Saddles as well, <laughs> you know. Could be, could be, for it, but, indeed. Although, yeah, I mean, like, a lot of the period detail in this film is, like, ridiculous. Yeah. Like, they really, the sets for Tombstone were you know, as close as you could get to recreations of of Tombstone and um the all the all the clothes are, you know, period correct and stuff like that. They were wearing fucking uh, period appropriate wool and Arizona temperatures, which um, was real hard on them during filming, but yeah. you know, um like uh you know, I listened to an interview with like the behind the scenes documentary where the production designer Carthen Hardwick, who would go on to direct um, Thirteen and uh, less successfully Twilight, um, you know, like she was talking about all the the stuff that they did to get period correct wallpaper and period period correct lightning f- uh, fixtures, and and I think a lot of that comes from like Kevin Jar's like obsession of getting everything everything right and being like Jesus. detail focused i know nothing about filmmaking and that just yeah. sounds like a bastard chore that does doesn't it jesus yeah. <laughs> well and this is also kind of where you, we get we also have to mention the because it pops up a lot the it's not the fast writing montages but like the throwback <laughs> to the western we get honest scenes in the beginning of them like seeing you know the horse and buggies or whatever it is where it's just you know a couple minutes of just watching them ride around yeah so we get all that too <laughs> yeah which I, I it's obviously a kind of tip of that to the kind of classic kind of john yeah. ford stuff wagon train and uh the searches and rio grande things like yeah, anything with the wagon train in basically you know You've, yeah. got to put yeah. that, you've got to put you've got to have a shot in a western with a wagon train otherwise it's not a western you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very true or um J- john ford's er- erp movie um my darling clementine oh yeah i forgot yeah. that he did one i had no idea that was john ford and i thought i knew most of his films i had no idea you just schooled me there scott <laughs> <laughs> it's just because i was looking things up today <laughs> and, and so this is where we get i know i kind of mentioned it prior but like where it I don't know. I know I mess, mess, messaged you about it, Scott, where there are elements that, and it goes back to the, I guess the 1950s style, what we were just talking about, where it gets kind of, I put hokey as a way, but it's also, I don't know, where you, they get into town and why it is basically propositioned to be the, the new sheriff and he denies it. And then he hears about, you know, the, they call it the Oriental, the saloon, which isn't doing well, but it's a wonderful place. And he goes and walks away and you have Virgil go, oh, that Wyatt, you know, it's Sam Elliott, which, you know, I, I love Sam Elliott, but. Everybody but, loves Sam yeah, Elliott, don't they? You get, yeah. <laughs> you get that whole kind of element where like that is, I think it feels like for the next 30 minutes you have people either talking about Wyatt or introducing Wyatt or it's like just all of the stuff where that's all it is is people just like how can we like put Wyatt even more on some pedestal or yeah they're, you know. they're building his mythology for yeah. the so you're, you're sort of it's it's an origin story in effect it's a superhero yeah. origin story you're getting sort of like the back end of it so you can move on and go oh, come out for him to get his guns out it's going to be great you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah he goes into the saloon and the reason why nobody's going in there is because of a young billy bob thornton (laughs) (laughs) yeah um the marshal the marshal tells him mate you can't go into the oriental because it's a real slaughterhouse (laughs) so he just walks across the road into it it's brilliant (laughs) that's how we know he's a badass yeah (laughs) if we weren't already convinced enough (laughs) yeah well it's funny as they talk about it being like this real slaughterhouse so you're assuming Oh, that must be where all those cowboys hang out and it's just wild and, you know, punching or whatever. And you go in and there's just like four people in there. Yeah. It's Billy, Billy Bob, Bob Thornton yelling at people. Billy Bob Thornton and a bucket of chicken. That's all he's got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, I, I was reading as well that apparently um, this kind of confrontation with Billy Bob in the uh, the Oriental, like that wasn't part of the script. Like Billy Bob Thornton was just told he was just given the direction, act like a bully, and then he just uh, improved like his his oh, lines wow. in the Oriental. I'm surprised how many times Billy Bob Thornton. It, it sounds like that's a recurring thing of him just improvising. A, like they just tell him to improvise a scene. Yeah. I feel like that's happened a bunch. But no, I love the... Um, so again, White Earp is slapping him around. <laughs> but um, I, this whole build-up, I love. And I think it's hilarious. Um, and we'll get into when they come back meet Doc Holliday. But I wrote down in the notes the weird... However, Wyatt phrases it where he says, skin that smoke wagon and see what happens <laughs> and then like and jerk it out. And like he's like we use all these kind of weird phrases as he's slapping them around and then he just basically pulls them by the ear like a child. Yeah. And throws them out. Yeah. He gives the, he gives the fantastic line of, you're going to do something or just stand there and bleed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a great line. Yeah. It? Uh, he has some build, like, while Doc Holiday gets most of the best lines, uh, Kurt Russell does, uh, like, as White Earp does have some, uh, belters as well. Yeah. I did want to, cause I've, I've written it down my notes and, uh, I did want to mention something that happens just a little bit before, um, where they meet the county sheriff, Bean, who's played oh, by what John Tenney. Hmm? <laughs> what a piece of shit he is as well. What a piece of shit he is as well. Yeah, yeah, he, he absolutely is. Um, uh, like, but we know that he's a piece of shit straight away um, because he is talking about all his different roles where he's like, I'm county sheriff <laughs> and also like I'm on the, you know, town, town housing but planning and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm the tax collector. And he is also the chair of the non-partisan anti-Chinese yeah. league. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote that down as well because I couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, say what? And nobody blinks. And it, yeah. nobody's like, eh, eh, hang on, wind up again. Like, what's that? Non-partisan anti-Chinese. Yeah. No, that's, I'm surprised there hasn't been a Western that's dealt with it because there's so many Westerns that will reference like the, even McCabe and Mrs. Miller talks about like all the kind of crimes against um, Chinese and stuff like that during it, the Chinese immigrants and but yet nobody really, I'm, yeah, in like trying to revise Westerns or make an anti-Western, <clears throat> nobody's really made one about the like, Chinese immigrants during I, the Western I period. assume because all of that history has been burnt and forgotten as best they can because it's, yeah. it's the period of American history I'm pretty sure nobody wants to remember. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That's what yeah. we do best. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, going back to Billy Bob Thornton, I mean, yeah. I, just going through the cast, and we mentioned loads and loads of the cast. I wrote my note. I wrote down was it's like the same in Private Ryan of westerns. Yeah. It's like you can't turn around for hitting either a future star or a star. Yeah. It's crazy. Everybody in every role is, has either gone on to bigger things or was a big star at the time. It's and I, I, I don't know if it's because it's been a while since I watched it, but I don't remember that. So I'm sort of sitting there going, "Holy shit, that's Powers Booth!" and "Holy shit, that's Michael Bain!" You know. And, yeah. Just, and then, of course, we got some more coming up as well. Yeah, that's true. And now, because so they, we yeah. get um, a pair of actors coming out of Concarage, and one of those actors is uh, like they're actors in the movie as well as being actors. Yeah. Uh, but one of those actors <laughs> is uh, Billy Zane. Oh, wait, her, I guess jumping back a little bit to finish the Billy Bob Thornton section, um, th- what cracks me up and then why Doc is so great is that they they see Doc, they kind of meet him and say, oh, what are you doing in this town? And they're having this interaction. And you have, but you're having Billy Bob Thornton come out with a shotgun ready to kill Wyatt Earp. And that's why he's stopped by Doc. And then he's just standing there with the shotgun as um, Doc and the Earps are talking. And then he does the whole, oh, Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. Yeah, you can great. leave. <laughs> like it's this whole, <laughs> as he's just I just read that in my notes as well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was real fun. And then he says, um, what he's also talking about because it introduces the other guys that eventually help the Earps too, the, where, um, Doc ends up saying, like, it's very cosmopolitan as a joke because they just witness two men or these two men <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. It is, a it, on, yeah. A full on um, lawful murder is what it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, so uh, this is where we get the, the introduction of um, Wyatt's uh, soon, soon to 
be love interest, despite his marriage. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Josephine Marcus, played by Dana Delaney. Yeah. And it's very on the nose, and it's like everybody in the town knows that Wyatt has a thing for her. She has a thing for I don't know. It's yeah, it's very it's broadcasted especially by Doc a lot. <laughs> well, it's broadcasted by Wyatt himself. Like yeah. I have literally written in my notes when they go to the theater show, I've literally written Erp doesn't even try to hide his perving. Like in front yeah. of his wife. <laughs> He's just like It's a different what? time, Scott. Scott that it's woman a is so time. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's a different time, Scott. What are you doing? It's the nineteen eighteenth century. What are you doing? It's a different time. Well yeah, that's why I'm curious in the, the original draft if there was more with his wife, because you basically from after that point you just see her as either more drugged up or she's like trying to connect with him and then he doesn't want to and then she's like oh okay never mind i'll leave (laughs) he's like no it's okay we can do something she's like no it's fine and then she goes and does more like opium or whatever (laughs) and but that's her whole character from this point on well that's that's pretty much that, I mean, that that there is a mouthful yeah. for every woman in the yeah. film. <laughs> yeah. Delaney. Not one of them has any motivation other than to be a wife and to be there when something goes wrong to mop up the blood. There's no agency from these from the women. It, it, it is, in that sense, sort of like a, an old John Ford Western, where it's, you know, it's it's a manly country, is is uh, is uh, the old West. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's like, um, we're kind of, we uh, this would be jumping ahead, we can jump back <laughs> again. But um, to kind of uh, go off of that point, Wayne, I think, that was another one of this movie's kind of kind of half arsed things where we do have like this speech from Josephine um just not long after Wyatt meets her, where she's like, you know, the kind of strong independent woman speech. And yeah. then like she has no agency after that. It's like, <laughs> oh, we're gonna give her a badass introduction and then we're gonna do nothing with her after Yeah. It, yeah. It's I mean, we're going back again. This is 1993, and from you know, from the last five years, obviously our world has completely moved on, rightly so. Um, but we're going back to 1993, where you know, it's the, the Bechdel test. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Passed in this film? I don't think so. You know, I don't think it's anywhere near it. But it's one of them where they've got to they've got to put them in there, but they really don't know what to do with them at all. Yeah. Yet the only point where it could potentially pass is like the quick scene where she runs in to tell them, "I think something bad's about to happen" or whatever, and it's like, and then the guy busts in and shoots up the, you know, obviously we, that's jumping way ahead, but shoots up their house. <laughs> like that's the only time you actually see multiple women interacting with one another in yeah. the whole thing. I don't think there's a there's a scene in the film where there's a woman on screen without a man is there at all. Yeah, I don't think there is one is there. <laughs> there's, there's always a member of our either good guy party or villain party in the scene with, with one of these guys. So where are we now, boys? We're at the theatre, aren't we? That's where we've just got yeah. to, isn't it? We're at the theatre, where, and I've written in my note, like, because uh, one of the things that all the cowboys, um, I'm not quite sure why the cowboys would be at a, th- a theatre show, but they are anyway, and uh, <laughs> they amuse themselves by, like, shooting at the axe, yeah. and one of the things that entertained me most about this, and I've written in my notes, is gunshots can't throw off Zane's Shakespeare. Yeah. He's incredible. No, I mean, that's what he is. That's just, how just, yeah. <laughs> That's how good Billy Zane is. I mean, people don't give him credit for it. But... I'll tell you what, have either of you seen Kenneth Branagh's Henry V? I have not, actually. Uh, nothing compared to Billy Zane's. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, talk about talk about cast again. In this scene, uh, you've already mentioned the guy from Sex and the City. That's John Corbett. Yeah. He, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Jason Priestley now turns up. Yeah. And uh, Terry O'Quinn from, uh, for those of you who don't know Terry O'Quinn, uh, and you're not Jag fans, he's Locke from Lost. He turns up as well. Oh, uh, yeah, no. And I... if you're a horror fan, you might know him from The Stepfather. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I like how he's, um, because normally, so you have the marshal or whatever, and you have um, the mate. I like that the mayor is actually a decent guy, which is kind of different in some weird Western way where you're expecting him to be like, oh, well, town money and greedy, just like whatever. But he's kind of the one that even talks to the marshal later on. Like, isn't that your job to like bring the peace when, you know, um, 
Powers Booth is shooting all over the place when he's high on opium, or all this sort of stuff, so he kind of plays this decent character. But mm. uh, Jason Priestley, uh, I did put Billy Zane and homoeroticism, because... <laughs> They definitely put that in there, but and then it doesn't go anywhere. You know, you have like these little, like these two little scenes when he's there and then the other in- interaction that they have, I guess, after he's. Yeah, I was kind of confused by that. Like, because uh, I, I was thinking, was that, is that a drop subplot or something? Or is that just yeah. something they've, they've added on top for no reason? Because there's definitely the suggestion that Jason Priestley's character, Billy, has a crush on Billy Zane's character, Mr. Yeah. Fabian. But, like, it's just, yep, we can, don't can delve you, into it any further. Yeah. Can, can you, well, just, just one before we go. Can any of you, either of you tell me, what is the point of Jason Priestley in this film? <laughs> no, I couldn't I, figure I, it out. He's he's a deputy marshal, but you don't really know that until. Oh, you don't know that until way later in the yeah. film. He's just like the cowboy stooge that they kind of like make fun of, and he just kind of hangs out with them anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. it's one of those characters. I mean, by by the time you find out who the by, by the time you find out who he is, I still didn't care. Yeah. Like, okay, you can cut this character completely, and I got him confused completely with a think a character from Young Guns too. Okay. <laughs> so I kept expecting him to be drawing um like little sketches and things yeah. of of the the cowboys, and I was like, he hasn't drawn anything yet. What's going on? Yeah. I was like, I think I've got the character wrong. <laughs> <a bit>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a nothing character. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't. Well, need to be they even give him that big moment, his kind of last scene. You see him where he finds again, spoiler alert, and we're jumping <laughs> ahead, but um, where Billy Zane he finds him dead, and then he's basically like, oh, I can't do the same more and he rides off quitting the cowboys and leaving that marshal because he has this change of heart but again like but it doesn't have any weight behind it because we don't even know who you are and you haven't really we just know you like billy zane and now you are upset with the cowboys and that's it right yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, but i think um We've we've kind of uh, shot on a bunch of things in the movie, yes. so let's let's talk yes. about one of the high points. It comes just just not long after the theater things, where it's yes. one of my personal favorite scenes in the movie. Uh, Johnny Ringo and Doc Holliday have a <laughs> Latin off. I, I literally <laughs> wrote. I was gonna say. I'm surprised you said it too. I, in my notes, I wrote Latin off with cup spin. Exclamation point! Oh, yeah. everything about this! I love everything about this scene. Yeah. I love the pistol spinning. I love the cup spinning. I love the Latin off. I love the crazy-eyed looking Michael Bean's face. I yeah. like, um, like Val Kilmer's little thing about like I, I, I think I hate him. Like, I yeah. don't like. Uh, I just, I now I did all like now I know I hate him. You know, like yeah. it's, <laughs> oh, everything's so good. Yeah, this this bit is fantastic, yeah. and and it it sort of shows you that that. I mean, Doc looks worse and worse throughout the film. And yes. That, that yeah. sort of pallid skin that they do in him. The, the makeup job on that is fantastic because I believed it 100%. You know, yeah. so I think that when the cameras roll, they give um, their Valkyrie with some oxygen or something. You know I mean? When they called cut. That's how, <laughs> that's how believable I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. There's another bit with Stephen Lang, who is a piece of shit, <laughs> um, <laughs> where um, where he says to... Uh, he leans over the table. This is just before the Latin off. He leans over the table to uh, Wyatt Earp, and he says, Lord, don't go around here. Love yeah. that. <laughs> uh, well, I, lo- I don't know. Stephen Lang is Ike. He's it's, and it. He's a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes. It's one of those Western characters, or in a bunch of action movies, where he's like the cowardly, crappy character that they keep letting live for some reason, yeah. and he keeps doing horrible things. And so throughout the whole movie, you're like, why haven't they just killed him yet? They've killed all the other people. Just kill him already. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. But, but yeah, so this is supposed to be the scene that really. Even though we've spent it introducing all the characters and bringing them in, this is like the scene where they're all now together in one place. And um, she the um, she sees Wyatt and he sees her, but he's trying to ignore her while he's dealing cards. And then you also have yeah the Jason Presley and Billy Zane part where he invites him to sit with them. Then mm. eventually goes that's the scene in itself it doesn't go anywhere and yeah you're kind of now they're all chatting a little bit but not really it's just now they're all in the same place and we're kind of okay now we can get things rolling 
because they're all ready to go. Yeah, yeah. that's the, sort of the end of the first act, isn't it? You get everything yeah. together and you introduce everybody, so all the moving parts can then be oiled for the second part, isn't it? Yeah, and that, of course, where we get kind of, what there's more philosophy elements where they talk about the white light after you die, which is Bill Paxton's really only big thing, I guess. He, I kind of wish he was in it a little bit more, but then... After that, we get kind of another jump back from the grittiness to then having this romantic ride that just kind of feels a little out of place a little bit. Yeah, it it does feel a little bit. And as I mentioned, like uh, the character of Josephine kind of gets this badass speech about how she's not a proper lady. And then like just as it's been a recurring theme throughout the, the seasons we've done is like female characters often start out interesting and then immediately become uninteresting. And Although I did love her little bit of um, patronizing Wyatt. I thought that was very funny where she explained the meaning of fortuitous to him like he's an idiot. Yeah. And she and we know that he wants to settle down, but she knows better because they're the type of people that want to just live off room service and travel around and whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's <clears throat> She's a, I don't, yeah, another, it's one of those things that, you know, they did the floaty McFloat face and, and it's sort of, you could have cut that scene in half, maybe. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, and just cracked on with it. But I like the whole, I'm an oak. Yeah, I'm an oak, all right. I, I enjoyed that bit. Cause yeah. it's, oh, it's just cause it's Kurt Russell that delivering that line. I think if anybody else would just go, oh, what a load of shit that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the same page with you there. I mean, effectively, like you say, I, Wayne, I think, you know, they felt that they needed to have um, female characters, but they didn't know what to do with them. So in essence, it becomes like they, they knew so little of what to do with them that you could effectively cut them out in the movie and it made no difference. Yeah, I, I think they're sort of going for, um, I think it's Rio Grande, uh, Rio Grande, the John Wayne film. They get the Ma- Maureen O'Hara story in there with that, and it's a complex relationship. But mm. uh, Maureen O'Hara's got presence, and there's a lot for her to do in that, yeah. even though it's little. Um, whereas in this... Yeah, it's just, I think it's there just to, to show you that Wyatt hasn't, Wyatt hasn't left that, you know, lawman life and that sort of thing. He's still, you know, chasing everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know from what I read up that Kurt Russell really worked, basically wanted to, um, refine and focus strictly on the relationship between Wyatt and Doc. I think in his, while well, he was, well, you know, not directing mm. it, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, yeah, so I'm again. I wish I could have seen or the original script and just see if there was more for them to do or something. If yeah. or if they only yeah, if they cut out the stuff, a lot of the stuff to just focus strictly on Doc and Wyatt. But it'd be interesting. I will mention, like in terms of like uh, Kurt, you know, wink, wink, not directing. <laughs> I do <laughs> want to say that I think it's it's refreshing and fun to be talking about a man who it seems like a good guy you know <laughs> like it's not like um, we've had Seagal and Stallone just mountains of ego and here is Kurt Russell he he cut some of his scenes um out, out of the movie to gain the, the trust of the cast uh for you know for this project going forward he, he cut out some of some of his own scenes uh in in terms of getting the running time, time down and he just seems like a he just seems like a good dude, and yeah. I just wanted to point that out. And um, it's a fun, refreshing thing. He is a Disney kid, after all. Yeah, you know what I mean. He did. He did. Stay, he did cut his teeth back in. Uh, was it the, the computer wore tennis shoes? Yeah, yeah. the computer wore tennis shoes. Yeah, one of, one of his was... first films, way back in 1969. Uh, do you know what his first film is? I don't know what his first film is, but that's one of his early films. His his first film is in. It happened at the World's Fair with Elvis. Oh, all oh, right. When he was like 10 years old, I think it is. So okay. if you ever get so if you get a chance to see that, you'll see a very, 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 very young Kurt Russell. <laughs> okay, I have not, I've not seen that. Uh, uh, fair enough. I, that's my life. I spend watching old westerns and, and Elvis movies. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> fair play. Uh, yeah. And so uh, after this whole ordeal, and we get another quick scene, which is just there to remind us that his wife does drugs. <laughs> Or something, you know, where he it has to be brought up again. Is that the same? Is that the same bottle that? Um, can't remember. Mm. It was um, if it was Morgan or Virgil's wife who gave her the the bottle of it. But it's clear that he she's 
kind of moved on to a new bottle and going a little bit harder with it. I, I actually like this scene because I think yeah. it sets up what's to come on yeah. that evening. You know, the tone changes. You've been out, he's been out riding with Josephine in the afternoon and, you know, what could have been, you know, out riding and flirting and having this nice time in, in the, um, in the daisy fields. And then mm. he comes home and a smash of reality smacks him around the face and his wife's addiction. And I like that it balances right there and tips so you understand that the next scene is sort of, it brings you along to that next, you know, yeah. uh, scene out in the out in Tombstone. Yeah, no, I agree because it takes us to, um, like, what is it, Curly? Curly, Curly Bill, Bill, yeah. Who Curly decides Bill. to do a bunch of opium and then fire an infinite number of shots from the six shooters, apparently, <laughs> because it doesn't, he never reloads, but he just is firing all about town. And this is kind of where, you get the marshal is being told even by the mayor, shouldn't you handle this? And he's like, well, it's not my jurisdiction. It's um, the sheriff's. And the sheriff reluctantly goes out. Yeah. Cur- poor, Curly old B- master, yeah. poor old sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Curly Bill doesn't even, he also kind of feels, he doesn't know what he's doing. So he's not entirely sinister, I guess, in that. He shoots him. But then since he's so doped up, he doesn't realize that he just killed him. But yeah, we get even more. Uh, Wayne, for your benefit, Stephen Lang to really oh, show that he's a coward. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, I mean, I love this part where Wyatt points the gun at his forehead. Yeah, that's a great. And, yeah, and he says, "Well, I might, you know, your guys might get me in a rush, but I'll turn your head into a canoe." And they're that's still going to do it. Yeah. And he's like, "No, he's not. He's not joking." <laughs> Or something. He's not that bluffing. Fan- what yeah. a fantastic line that is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, talking about good lines, we did miss a Kilmer line um, just previously um, when he was sitting playing piano at the bar where, oh, um, yeah. where, oh. where the guy, the, the, the guy, uh, like he's saying, like, "Oh, are you playing?" And then he r- rhymes off like this, you know, this other guy's yeah, songs. And, yeah, whatever. And then he he says, "Oh no, it's is a nocturne." And the guy goes, "What's that?" And he goes, "Frederick fucking Chopin." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that guy who's saying that is Thomas Hayden Church, who, you know, again, another one of the. Yeah. He's very, very young in this movie. Right, yeah. He is. Um, yeah. Oh, this is like this is a thing that kind of came up in in last week's recording. So, like in last week's recording, we we you know like um, as the audience will be well aware, we talked about. Backdraft, and in the backdraft episode that I recorded with uh, Caleb, um, I asked him if Scott Glenn is a vampire because he has always looked like that and still looks like that. And <laughs> um, I'm going to ask the same question about Sam Elliott: Is Sam Elliott a vampire because he has always looked like that and still looks like that? It's the moustache, mate. It's all yeah. his power is in that moustache. So, it's, it's like it's like his kryptonite. You take that moustache off, he's dead. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I fully believe that. I 100. percent yeah. <laughs> so I watched recent. I finally watched the movie. It's the horror movie Frogs, and um, all right, yeah. And Sam Elliott's in it, and I didn't even recognize it because he has brown hair, no mustache. He's like the lead in it, and it's from the I can't it's sixty. I can't remember the exact date, but um, oh, okay. I was just watching it because it was on this collection of DVDs I had. I was like, whatever, try it. And I was yeah, very surprised. <laughs> I was like, Wait, no. That's not. That can't be Sam Elliott. <laughs> oh, that's that's weird. I I can't even imagine Sam Elliott without a mustache. Oh, it's a bit like watching shouldn't. Deliverance and being like, "Why is Burt Reynolds not got a mustache? What is going <laughs> on here?" <laughs> Brilliant. <sighs> but we have Sam Elliott. Basically, you know, he's the good guy here, and he realizes that there has to be law and order in a town, and that he can't take money away from all these town folk and then, you know, just let them all fall, especially when a kid's about to get run over. Oh, yeah. And he yeah. sees the the mother of the kid who's upset, and she also has a scar across her face, and he decides he's going to become the new sheriff. It's, it's, yeah, it's a good little bit of, it's a good little bit of expositional scene, that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that 90 seconds, so that the mayor turns up, gives him a load of shit, and says, you're going to stand for this. This is what the town's turning into, and you can do something about it. And then, obviously, like you say, the, the kid nearly gets run over, and it's just a nice little, you can see the chain of thought of, can I stand by and let this happen? It's, it's, it's well done. It's well written. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then Morgan... Oh, I, I just, yeah. On a kind of totally random note, um, just before we kind of get that scene, there's like a wagon that goes by through the town. There's like this this movie's one bit of feminism where there's a wagon of all these women on it that says equal pay for equal work. And I was yeah. like, fair enough. <laughs> just... <laughs> 
<laughs> it sort of it sort of sums up every every lady in this film, doesn't it? Just yeah. on a wagon, just moving out of shot. You know. That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey. Uh, and don't blink during that scene because you won't see. It. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! I almost missed it. I was like, yeah. I was like, what? Oh, oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Random. <laughs> they look so happy about equal rights for equal pay as well, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> they, they look the most the miserable. Thing. They are the most miserable looking women <laughs> yeah, I, I've I ever seen. Board, till, I, till I stopped and read the board, I thought, Jesus, they're on the way to the noose like. That's what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it does look like they were being led to their death. It, it, oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> so we get all the way up to now. This is where Virgil becomes Mr. Popular, isn't it? Uh, he takes yeah. on he takes on the mayor's advice and he gets sworn in as a... Uh, is it a marshal or a sheriff? A sheriff. Uh, a marshal. Like, because like, yeah. we, we kind of got a bit confused because it was the, the town marshal that got okay. shot yes. by Curly yeah. Bill and uh, Behan is the county sheriff. Okay. Right. So right. sheriff is They're the CEO marshals. and the marshal is the next one, like runs the town sort of thing. Yeah. Got ya. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we found out that Curly Bill has been released. Um, three weeks later because the judge is a piece of shit must be from the Stephen Lang school of um, being a piece of shit he just says was anybody there to witness it no nobody witnessed it well it didn't happen then so the, the marshal must have shot himself apparently yeah. so they, they let Curly Bill out which is just well it's old west laws and it's probably I don't know what's, what's America like on gun law at the moment uh, <laughs> Craig, I don't know if I could we to talk about. <laughs> if you want to jump into that sort of politics let's, <laughs> let's just say it's I literally wrote so when he nails up the board that's like you can keep your you can have your guns you can carry it just don't keep your guns in town I wrote second amendment (laughs) about carrying guns it's it's like still the if that was today it would still be a thing I mean you have people like hey don't bring you can't bring a gun in school you're carried you know a gun you can permit that you have a permit for you openly carry and people still get upset about it so (sighs) yeah it's I guess it hasn't changed much. <laughs> in short, but I won't bore you with all of that. So, <laughs> so yeah, so um, Virgil becomes Mr. Popular as he, he swears in Morgan as well and obviously pisses off all the townsfolk by saying, you can carry your gun, just not in town. you got to hand it in the city limits. How do you police that? That's the next question. Yeah. You, have you got like a, is there like a, a like a border where you say, oh, you've got to hand your gun in? Well, well, it, lo- it looked yeah. like it was inside the, because there's the part with Ike where it's like you just have to give it to the person, you know, to the shop owner or whatever. Because oh, he, right. he gives his gun to the the barkeep Barman. when after right. it, when right. he slaps him at that one point, whatever, which we'll get oh. into. Yeah, Stephen Lang, piece of shit. Yeah, when, <laughs> when Doc he is really playing, is. He really is. <laughs> when Doc is playing 36 hours of poker and drinking yeah. nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> and he's still winning. And what you have basically is he keeps beating Ike. Ike is upset about it. Because he's a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and basically Virgil comes in and tells him, you're drunk, you gotta get out of here. You better not start anything. And so... We're just gonna go, and they all kind of start to go, as, or because um, Doc passes out and he starts bleeding from his mouth. So they carry him out, and Ike is talking about them being pimps, and they're just taking control of the land. And I think this is another point where we're supposed to, as you were talking, Scott, see both sides of it, but we don't really. Where, anyways, he keeps talking about, about pimps, and he's going to rip their pimp heart out. And the bartender basically says he wasn't cheating you, Ike, and he smacks him. <laughs> and then he grabs his guns and he's basically saying he's going to go kill him and all that. And that's where you know, Sam Elliott is right behind him, knocks him unconscious and then puts him in a holding cell, which then leads to him kind of being in a, a drunk tank type of thing. And uh, yeah, the his friends come to pick him up, but they're not too nice either. There's like a young kid who's talking about how he's going to take Wyatt Earp down because Wyatt Earp accidentally bumped into him and then Earp. <sighs> Um, takes out his gun, the kid's gun, really quick and knocks him out. And so, <laughs> yeah, because he I, says, "Oh, you can take that sorry and shove it up your ass," and then he just uh, knocks him out with his own gun. It's very funny. Yeah, and so yeah, it becomes that whole. That's basically it of setting up the OK Corral. But during the time, we also get more on Doc, <clears throat> where he's basically told that he can't be living this life that he's living until then. The doctor leaves. <laughs> And then his wife gives him another cigarette 
<laughs> you know, and she's saying how good she is to him and I, she's always taking care of him and he's like, yeah, you are good. But you may be the Antichrist or yeah, whatever. Let's, let's give him money. He's got, uh, let's give him money. He's got terminal lung disease. Yeah. Uh, smoke. <laughs> and then, you know, and he's also supposed to refrain from sex and all that too. He's supposed to have like complete rest and she does the exact opposite. Brilliant. Oh, dear. I also, like, we should have mentioned that like her character is called Big Nose Kate. It's not, I don't think it's really mentioned in the film. I think she is just no. like people say Kate in the movie, but she's credited as Big Nose Kate and apparently that's a historical yeah, she, figure, Big Nose Kate. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Something she else. Has, something else. <laughs> yeah, she has a whole Wikipedia page and everything you can look up on. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah. And uh, Big Nose Kate is, is played by uh, Joanna uh, Paluka, who we, we, um, we, the last time we met up with her, was uh, way back in our first episode when we covered uh, Mark for Debt. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, she's moved on to nicer cast members, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, that's that's a that's a lie. Our first episode was Hard to Kill. Mark for Death was their second episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the point now that I think it's the real change because Wyatt basically says, okay, well, I guess you better swear me in. And we get the, the Wyatt gun we finally see. And also the wife has kind of shown of like, oh, so you're getting dressed up in your lawman's get up. Mm. And I don't know, she's still high or something. I don't know. She's just there sitting there watching him. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, 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 what I got from this scene was I'm never going to look as cool as Kurt Russell in that scene <laughs> ever in my life. Because <laughs> he pulled off that hat, that gun, and that duster. That is incredible. He looked amazing. Loved it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it should also be mentioned that everybody in the movie um, grew a mustache for this movie, apart oh. from John Tenney, who plays the, the, the actor who plays uh, County Sheriff Behan. Uh, he's the only one who has a fake mustache. Every other mustache authentic mustache oh nice <laughs> <laughs> but so what i'll actually get so i remember reading up on the okay corral and how there's so many movies based around the okay corral and they even you know change locations or whatever but it's based on that and that hearing that that event really only took place over a couple seconds you know and it's kind of inspired all of these films and so it is interesting especially this it goes by really quick mm-hmm. and which so i guess is more authentic but i love how um so a lot of foreshadowing is Wyatt telling Morgan or whoever, you know, about what it's like to really kill a person and that the fear and he only in all of his years only killed one man. And then but you really see during the whole thing, the fear in everybody. And I think that part works where it's yeah. not like they're, you know, these macho men all just shooting. It's like you see that none of them really want to do it at first. Yeah. It's the, what you've been saying throughout this, like um, with them trying it with the, the tone of the film, where you're trying to get the cowboys to have a level playing field with the good guys so there's like there's no black and white sort of gray area and this scene is is one of the biggest turning points for me with yeah. it because basically what it goes to um morgan virgil sorry and he says so you're going after these cowboys on a misdemeanor because they're carrying guns you know it in essence, he's basically going after him because they've walked in the street or they've illegally parked. Yeah. That's what he's going after him for now. And it's sort of like, so you're going to pick a fight with these guys over something little, but it's, I suppose it's more about them respecting the law and Virgil's trying to push it into him. Like, you're not going to come to this town and you're not going to get away with this crap. I'm going to stop it. And I like, I like all that. How it's sort of, it's a storm in a teacup that then gets knocked over and, you know, just spills out into everything. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem I have with that is this scene gives the violence so much weight. And then that is completely disregarded in the second <laughs> half of the movie, where it's yeehaw, killing bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what you, you, I mean, said, since the beginning of this kind of and we've already talked about of like trying to find its place as a movie of like being that classic western just killing the bad guys or being that kind of revisionist anti-western that you know kind of making a commentary on the actual what the west really was and the act of violence in itself but yeah i do i do like some of the things they get right in this yeah uh, in yeah, tombstone yeah, like sure. um like the if you're firing a gun you couldn't really be that far apart because yeah. the guns were so badly machined 
machined that if you stood like 20 like like if you watch a Gary Cooper if you watch High Noon Gary yeah. Cooper shoots a man with a six uh, with a six shooter from about 150 feet yeah. it's like that bullet would have probably killed somebody in a different county <laughs> that's how bad these guns were so I like that they, they do their, their, their cloak quite close together really. yeah and I like going back to this film I like the next shot I'm also perplexed by the next shot um, when the lawmen walk towards the OK Corral and there's a there's a um, house on fire behind them. It's raging and these guys just carry on to the cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you, you guys? Shouldn't you be going and dealing with some of this fire, maybe? Not yeah. worried about these guys with guns? Because that house looks like it could burn down the whole damn town, if I'm honest. Yeah. So, yeah, I was a bit confused. But anybody anybody understand that scene? No. <laughs> it, it, it I have amazing. the exact same feeling as you, Wayne that plot wise makes no fucking sense cinema wise looks cool as fuck yeah. absolutely <laughs> i'm glad it wasn't just me because i was like yeah that looks amazing but they really should be probably putting that out <laughs> yeah maybe it's to show they're on a you know that they're on a mission and <laughs> other lives don't matter it's only <laughs> the death of these men <laughs> i mean as wayne points out you know that that fire does look like it's getting out of control and like um it looks like potentially could burn the whole town down <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> so there wouldn't be a town to defend i like i like when they're walking towards it morgan just sort of look like tentatively looks over his shoulder as if to say lads fire and they're like oh no we're doing this oh we're doing this right we're doing this okay <laughs> yeah also like um you know just looking at the looks in their eyes as well and also in the previous scene where you know like virgil like knocks out ike you know one of the things i was thinking in this segment of the movie i was just like i never never want to get the Sam Elliott death stare at me. I, I just like wilt completely. I'd just be like, I'm so sorry, whatever I did, please stop looking at me like that. <laughs> well, it's those eyebrows too. It's like yeah. a mustache. It's like, but this is kind of a pivotal scene in, or kind of before, right before that, in establishing even more so the Doc Holiday, Holiday White Earp relationship. Because White Earp is basically saying, "You don't have to be here, Doc. This isn't your fight." And he, he's upset about it, Doc, where he's like, "How dare you say that to me?" And then they even he ends up saying it later of like, "Well." White Earp's my friend, so I'm doing this for him. Or, like, well, he, White Earp has a lot of friends, or something. And he says, well, I don't. Or something, you know, there's some mm. kind of discussion about why um, Doc is so willing to lay down his life specifically for Wyatt, I think. Yeah. Which yeah, is, you know, great. And it, it, even after the OK Corral is over, they're the ones that are left as everybody else, you know, goes off with their love interests or even wine herbs <laughs> wife comes up and then walks away again you know <laughs> but let's yeah. get to the corral part first before we get into that yeah, yeah so the marshal turns up here doesn't he and he goes oh i've disarmed them you haven't got yeah. to do <laughs> also what a piece of shit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's kind of one of the unfortunate things that like sheriff behan doesn't really he doesn't get his comeuppance he's just like yeah it, it, like oh. he just disappears from the movie at a certain point and you're like oh okay which oh, yeah. i wonder if he did because that even happens with michael rooker when you see him you know at, i mean we'll spoil it when he dies you don't see it but you're kind of mm. no there's a couple mo moments where you're like so did he just get killed in the the montage of riding and killing that is yeah. about to happen or what I, I yeah I, I don't know the michael rooker thing is a bit different because yeah. we do get there is a deleted scene yeah um where michael rooker kind of meets up with johnny ringo and the gang and then they have a little bit of a kind of confrontation and then it's kind of he isn't killed in the scene but you know that he's going to die um, okay. And then, and and then, obviously, in the movie, you would see him later, um, as you mm -hmm. do in the movie. Uh, but there is, so there is a deleted scene there that explains that a bit better. But um, as as far as I know, I, I don't know if there's any deleted scenes uh, to do with Bian. Okay, that makes sense. Then. Yeah, mm -hmm. but okay. so I guess the OK Corral, we get they come around the corner after Sheriff Bian jumps into the <laughs> room where. Um, She's getting pictures taken of herself, I guess. Or she's posing for some, I don't know. But, and you just see Ike, did you want to say 
<laughs> say it when. Oh, sorry, yeah. Stephen Lang, what a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was caught up in there. Apologies. <laughs> no um, but you see him and his head's and they're trying to like sober up or something, which yeah. is another thing Wyatt said of just like, just wait it out and let them sober up and then they'll kind of come to their senses and leave and it'll be fine or something. But Virgil couldn't deal with that. <laughs> nope. Yeah, but they're just kind of hanging out. They're not even doing anything. It's not like they're causing a ruckus or anything. They're just like, his head's in water. Some of them are sitting around. They're just talking. Yes, it's a strange moment, isn't it? Because you're like, I don't know, in my head, I had the gunfire to the OK Corral as like this big sort of, you know, standoff that's, that's led by, it's been led to, up to by, you know, many different factors. And yeah, the factors have been there. But when you get to the OK Corral, it's just because they've turned up with some guns, it's not like they've, took prisoners or hostages or anything yeah. or they've rode into town and killed a boatload of people. It's just like they've rode into town and they've still got their guns. It's like, okay. So again, you're going, it's that whole, we're trying to make the cowboys look as, you know, gray area as the lawmen. And it's like, well, not really. Cause we already know that the cowboys are absolute pieces of shit and they, they shouldn't really, you know, I feel like the, there was a, it needed a better, reason for them to be there if, if you know what i mean they could have yeah but if, if they're going off sort of historical events then i suppose they've just got to be right haven't they i have i have no <laughs> idea about the the uh the okay corral other than what i've seen in films and this one in particular so i think it's one of those it's one of those events that it's so popular but then i mean i could be wrong but i I think it's like it was all word of mouth, so you have oh, right. so many different interpretations of what yeah, it actually. You have, you yeah. have no reliable narrators for it. Yeah, then. he said, she said, sort of thing. Yeah. Right? Okay. Well, that makes no sense at all in this. Then they could, they yeah. could have they could have got a different contrivance while they're there. But I suppose, like you're saying, they're trying to grey the areas, aren't they? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Because none of them are actually going to when it happens. So they all kind of they they haven't drawn yet but they're all about to. They're sitting there. And is it Thomas Hayden Church who draws first? Or yeah. Is it somebody? Yeah, uh, where... It's, it's um, basically Thomas Hayden Church's character, Billy Clanton. Yeah. He looks like he's going to draw, and Wyatt knows that he's about to draw. So they draw almost at exactly the same time, but Billy draws slightly before. Okay, yeah, because I know it. He says the why it says the line where he's I, I can't remember now what's it. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, um, Holiday winks at him, doesn't he? Doc Holiday winks at Tom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, and he goes he goes for his gun. He's like, oh no, don't do it! Don't, oh <laughs> yeah. shit! That's yeah. it now. <laughs> and it does really go with um, the accuracy of those guns because they are right on each other, just yeah. firing off, and it's barely hitting anything. Which you know, Virgil and um, Morgan get hit in the legs, or no. Morgan gets hit hit in the arm, right? Yeah. And Virgil gets shoulder. hit in the leg. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've got written down. They, they get wounded either in yeah. the leg or in the shoulder, yeah. yeah. And then Billy just takes, like, a bunch of them for a bit. <laughs> they, like, unload, a, after a while, unload a whole round into them. But finally, one's about to kill Doc, but Morgan's able to kill him. And as um, Doc also shoots him as well. And Yeah. And then, of course, Ike throws down his guns and... As the coward. <laughs> what a piece of shit. <laughs> he runs away again to fight another day. I, like what? you say, Craig, uh, why they don't just kill this fucker off, we <laughs> don't know, but um, yes. Yeah, he runs towards um, Wyatt's Earp and uh, Earp says to him, you're in the fight or you're not, or get out the hell, uh, get the hell out of the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Quick, quick question for you, right? So Go on. one of the guys is stood behind a horse while this gunfight is going off, and then... Holiday fires his shotgun into the air, yeah. causing the horse to rise, um, to, to buck. Why didn't the horse buck before with the gunshot? <laughs> I was, I, get, I, I watched it again and went, ooh, I'm not sure about that, yeah. if I'm honest. But. Apparently, horses only buck when it's a, a shotgun. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Good to know. When next yeah. time I'm out in the country, it's fine. Yeah, it's, uh, you know. It, it's one of those well-known facts about horses. 
<laughs> Six from the shooters city. don't do yeah. nothing to them, but like shotguns, that's that's yeah. what really freaks them yeah. out. Is it like in a horse manual? Yeah, you yeah, can yeah, wear but, a six shooter, but for God's sake, don't fire a shotgun round them. You'll, you'll yeah. well the trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the very famous horse man, horse western manual of uh, <laughs> I forgot who wrote it. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> so, so anyway, so they get all killed. Um, everybody kind of comes up, leaves. Even the um, yeah, they all leave. Basically, Doc and Wyatt there. Or by themselves, and then we get to see the the cowboy's funeral, where you know now something more is going to be happening because they're walk running by or they're doing their parade or whatever you call it to yeah. um to the cemetery by Wyatt and Virgil and all of them. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's a it's a good juxtaposition because the the lawmen are sat out on the stoop, and it's almost like they're antagonizing them. Now the bit I got from this was. These cowboys have got a cheek. They're walking down yeah. the road with with a sign that says "Murdered on the Streets of Tombstone." Yeah. What? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fair yeah. point, you know. To get morally offended, you know, like um, you know, given all the stuff they've done, yeah, it's got some cheek. Ridiculous. Yeah, and this is that's another point where it's like you're supposed to feel. I, I don't know, like. Well, maybe the cowboys weren't fully, like, yeah, it was all circumstance and they all kind of, nobody deserved to, nobody deserves to die, but again, it, you're not necessarily feeling any certain way about them. Like, you're not feeling like, oh, yeah, you know, it's, all those um, people died because of unfortunate circumstances and they shouldn't have. You're kind of like, well. When, when you watch yeah. the, the old, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, westerns, there's no gray area. You are yeah. you are the good guy with the star, or you're the bad guy with the the dusty hat, you know, the black hat, as it were. And there's no gray area. That's what you are. What Tombstone does with this is it paints the cowboys in a morally gray area where it shouldn't. And but what he does brilliantly is it paint it sort of it's moving the marshals and the sheriffs into that gray area where they shouldn't be, where yeah. they've gone and picked a fight with. The cowboys that shouldn't have been a fight. They could have got them on something else. You know, they had to wait a couple of hours. They'd have done something else. And it's like, you guys are in the wrong here for the right reasons. And now you've sort of brought your morality into, into, into disrepute. Like, uh, sorry, into repute because yeah. what you've mm. done is morally wrong. You know, you went after them over something silly where you should have waited and, and took them down over something much larger. And I, I think that's... A, it, talking about you guys, you know, you can take it apart a bit more and it makes a bit more sense as, uh, of the film and how they, they piece that bit together. But straight watching it, you're going, it was a bit silly, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it does lead us to probably the most famous scene in the whole movie. I think it is the most famous yeah. scene. Yeah. Like, I, I do want to, before we get to yeah. saying that most famous line again, I do like uh, Michael Bean's uh, performance as Johnny yes. Ringo yeah. and yes. like his little like monologue about like, I want your blood, I want your soul, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. The way he says as it's he's drunk. <laughs> It's that, uh, it's yeah. moustache twirling villain, yeah. But done for the the twentieth, well, the the twentieth century. Then yeah, the twentieth century. You know, he's he's like I say, he's wearing the black hat, moustache twirling, um, tying tying the ladies to the uh, to the uh, the railway line. <laughs> That's yeah, what he's yeah. doing. He's doing it yeah. in such a brilliant way because he's really sort of sadistic with it. Yeah. And yeah. You're a bit like, ooh, he's unhinged. That's what I, that's what I like about him. And then he obviously meets his his uh, his counter in in Holiday. Yeah. I mean, they, they're constantly referred to, or, well, Holiday himself kind of talks about, and, you know, even before that, they're just like each other. Mm. But, I don't know, they're watching it this time, and you always, I know, like, Ringo is one of the top spots, but, I don't know, for some reason, I didn't realize how good he's, like, I would almost, like, I mean, obviously, Val Kilmer steals the show, he's the best part, like, no hands down, but I'd almost put Ringo as a close second of like I would put in terms Ringo of as a acting as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I I agree completely because Holiday works brilliantly, but if you've got no villain that's equal to him, it sort of diminishes that 
that persona a little bit. So you got Michael Bean coming up to him in that same sort of, you know, raising his game to, to meet uh, Val Kilmer's. Yeah. yeah. The, the pair of them are fantastic to be. I, I mean, we're talking about, it. I don't think there's a really mediocre performance throughout the whole no, film. No. They all do it well, apart from Charlton Heston, but we'll get to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's uh, many like, weak links in the cast i think as we've discussed like there's some actors who don't get a lot to do you know mm. like any of the female actors and um, also jason <laughs> Priestley. but like yeah. not nobody's uh, nobody's bad necessarily no, no. It, yeah it seems more of script script issue maybe than it is an acting issue i don't know mm. or a direct Perhaps. yeah um but yeah so johnny ringo he wants after Wyatt, but no, because Wyatt's Holiday's friend, and because Doc Holiday has a, I don't know, has nothing to lose. He says the famous "I'm your Huckleberry" about wanting to play a game, and they're going to until Curly Bill comes up, because I think it's kind of suggested that Curly, well, they don't want to cause any more trouble and get caught. Yeah, but then I think they know that. Again, it's suggested by subtext or whatever. I always felt that they know that Doc can beat yeah. Ringo. I, I'd say even yeah, at that point, I think yeah. so. I, and I, I'm like, because I counted it as well. I think like one of the kind of disappointing things, and, and I, I know like the historical records, they're playing that off that a little bit there, and the people who were actually at the OK Corral are the people that they've placed at the OK Corral and all kind of it, but. Um, it, I, I did find it kind of disappointing that um, the fact that you've got Powers Booth chewing the scenery as Curly Bill and you've got Michael Bean chewing the scenery as Johnny Ringo. And I, I really enjoyed watching those characters so much. It is disappointing that you have this kind of bit in the movie where like Curly Bill kills the term Marshall at about 52 minutes in and then they both reappear here at like about an hour and 20 so yeah. you've got this big section and they're just not on the yeah. screen. Well, even in the, yeah, all leading up to it from the beginning opening scene, like you're led to believe that Curly Bill is going to be kind of the, you know, the big baddie in a way. Yeah. But he, yeah, he disappears and comes back and disappears and comes back and then he dies. Not at, I mean, he still dies at the end, but it's, you know, still early on comparatively to yeah. other characters. I like, I like the bit where he grabs hold of Doc Holliday and pulls him. Uh, sorry, he grabs hold of Johnny Ringo and pulls him. Yeah. Don't mind him; he's just drunk. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so well. I, I love. Long. I love just after that when Johnny Ringo just knocks over a bunch of the coffins on his way back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, brilliant. Oh, it's fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So after that is when we basically get into so Wyatt has kind of been reluctant or he's been, you know, I don't know. He's kind of been the calm and collected one and like, oh, well, we shouldn't, we should handle this accordingly if we're going to even handle this. Mm. But after the events coming up is kind of where we start into gun shooting, horse riding montages. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Which is all the assassination attempts. It's uh, it's all under the guise of a thunderstorm, isn't it? It's like a, you, there's a storm coming, boys. There's a storm coming. I, like, I quite like that um, <laughs> that allegory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so this is like the kind of cowboys' revenge. So we're kind of cutting in, be- cutting between things. There is a literal storm going on, a, a, a thunder and lightning storm. Uh, Virgil's walking around town. We get that uh, basically Josephine gets a tip off from County Sheriff Behan that shit's about to go down. So she tries to to warn the the wives of the Arabs, um, and a shooter comes in and shoots them. And and Virgil is obviously attacked, um, not seen on screen, uh, but mm. then he wanders back into the bar. He's all he's all bloody, and it's all generally uh, kicking off in Tombstone. And he, yeah, he will never have what, function in his arm, but it's not his, or it's not his good arm, so he yeah. can still hug his wife or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> then um, yeah, Morgan gets upset and goes out, and you think he's going to go find them, but instead he goes to play pool. Angrily, he, he yeah. plays billiards angrily, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> which then gets him shot 
and then um yeah, yeah we get the scene so of- i think like i don't know like i want to ask you guys a question at this point because like this is not Bill Paxton's fault. Cause he's a great actor. I, I love him in most things that he's in. And I think he's decent in this. But again, I think the character of Morgan is, is underwritten and, yes. um, it, it just, he's just kind of there. You know, like Virgil and Wyatt are the main brothers and, and, and Morgan's just kind of the afterthought. And so when he gets shot in the back and it's supposed to be this big melodramatic moment, and they're supposed to try and heighten the melodrama with the slow mo. And slow mo can be done really well. You know, thinking of other westerns, you know, something like the Wild Bunch, the slow mo is done excellently. This, I think it just comes off cheesy and it's just really the whole, I, I know it's like it's supposed to be this big emotional beat. And when like Kurt Russell is in the rain, he's like, Morgan, you know, <laughs> I just, I don't know. It just comes off kind of, it doesn't really work for me. It just comes off melodramatic to me. It didn't hit me as yes. like a, a big emotional moment in the way i think the movie wants it to from i agree with that yeah because it's you know these things are coming and they're going for the he's playing billiards and gets shot playing billiards and you knew it was coming somehow i think if they'd have done the um hitchcock way of doing it where Mm. you show the gun you show the window you show the angle of the you know of the shooter and do some quick cuts between so you know it's coming it probably would have heightened that scene a lot more. If not, it's just a man playing billiards, doing some decent acting, being shot in the back. That's what that scene is. There's no lead up to it, is that it just happens. It's kind of like Sam, uh, Sam Elliott being shot off screen. It just happens. Yeah. You know, and, and it's sort of, like you say, it takes away the gravitas of the moment. That's what it does. Yeah. I mean, because they, I don't know, they put all of that. I mean, I agree with both of you. And I wrote in there, yeah, I wrote that it gets really melodramatic, you know, because they have the whole scene of them trying to get it out and the whole purpose early on in a note, which I never actually said, I wrote that Bill Paxton is kind of underused. It's like his point there is to talk about, you know, he brings up God at some points or he brings Mm -hmm. up the white light and he has his, you know, kind of final line of saying, you know, that thing about the white light, I ain't seen, yeah. I ain't seen shit or whatever, yeah. however he phrases. Yeah. <laughs> or I don't see a damn thing. That's but, it. That's um, you know, it, it does feel like that was his only purpose in this movie. And so by doing that, we don't really feel it. And then we get the whole scene of them getting the bullet and shut the dog up. But then, yeah, it just, you see Kurt Russell in the rain sobbing and he's saying, get away, get away or whatever. And you're kind of like, oh, this is. We have uh, we have the scene there as well of yeah. the uh, a couple of the cowboys throwing their sashes in and saying, "What they did to your women, we don't agree with that." Yeah. So they found their point. That's it now. He's yeah. you know, it's Michael Rooker as well. I mean, I think, like you say, yeah. start the film, you see that uh, bride being taken into the chapel for an unpleasant time, and then obviously at this point he's reached his limit. You know, it's all right shooting at lawmen and things like that, but I'm not dealing with any more of your softness with shooting women unarmed women you know yeah it's it's i don't know it's uh, one of those scenes that it's there and it plays a part but there's no emotional weight in it again mm. maybe yeah. that's you know it's there to, to push the plot along yeah and well bill paxton also calls him that's what it feels weird too because he says it's all about you wyatt or something you're the one mm. right before he dies and it I don't know, it just, the whole scene in general just kind of, it plays weird. But, um, but yeah, after that we get, so they're supposed to go, they say they're leaving and they're doing their parade, not parade, uh, um, procession or whatever to take their dead brother and they look upset and they're all leaving and, um, which you don't, Wyatt and his wife haven't split up. She's there Mm. and, um, they're going and Ringo says that thing where you smell that smells like a person died. Yeah. And they're kind of chuckling or whatever. And they're going to Ike. <laughs> and, what a piece of shit. Yeah. And the other one are going to basically finish him off at the train station. Yeah. That, but, is, that, that, that yeah. scene you're talking about there where Johnny Ringo brings that up. I mean, that is straight lifted from Shane. That is, I don't know if you've yeah. seen Shane, that, that scene yeah. is straight lifted from that. There's the scene where Shane and the landowner walk past the people um, who are trying to t- take them off the land and they've killed one of the sort of like, it's too hard to explain, but they've killed somebody and they walk past the, uh, the crowd and they do the same. They walk past these crowd of cowboys and they do exactly the same. They antagonize them. They, right. they try and, you know, run them out of town as it were while they're leaving town. 
Yeah. But, also in that yeah. scene, I do like uh, Powers Booth just because it's the laconic way that um, after Kurt Russell has told him that he's leaving town, Powers Booth just goes, "Well, bye," <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, they get on the train, they're about to kill him, and then they get word, and they turn around, and one of them is shot, and then Ike instantly drops his gun and starts, and that's where, um, that's where face- Wayne comes in again. Yeah, yeah well, I was just, I was, I was just, the, in the, oh yeah, in the yeah. Oh, what a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's basically a coward, and he gets his face slashed by, um, Wyatt Spur and Wyatt. He tells them to run and tell all of them that if he sees a red sash, he's coming for him and tell him he's all hell's coming or what, basically the very beginning of the man with no name, pale horse. He's yeah. fulfilling yeah. that prophecy because he's the one. I, this is my favorite bit of acting from Kurt Russell in the movie because he goes so pro wrestling yeah. here. <laughs> like when he says the line, you called down the thunder and now you got it. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, I was like, ah, oh, Kurt's cutting a promo. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, that even, it, I mean, it goes into the scene when, so we get the riding montage of them just killing men and, yeah, you know, riding horses. My, my and, note says uh, montage of cowboy genocide. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah then, I've just put yeah. montage of riding and killing. It's like, yeah, because at this point in the movie, you know, like um, previously we've had these attempts at like give, kind of giving the violence weight, but the violence is given like no weight here. And like you're just watching it, and you're like, well, I guess these guys are bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them, it's like you know you see how many are getting shot and they're like just sitting in a bar and they crash through the with the door or when they crash through the wall on a horse and shoot them. Or some of them are just laying in bed. Like, yeah. And they do not attempt to arrest anybody. They're just yeah. like, they're just like, nah, fuck you guy. <laughs> yeah. Wild West death squad. <laughs> yeah. And then we get to the scene where I think of it like with kids where, um, if you're, if you're playing like, action whatever make believe with a child or, or and you are and there's like the kid that's like no you didn't shoot me <laughs> that's what it feels like with this scene where Kurt Russell is just yelling no and walking across the yeah. the water the river and he kills and like Curly Bill's shooting at him but can't hit him and he's going no and he's <laughs> blasted somehow he's killing everybody <laughs> that the weirdest thing about that is, right, so doing the research, um, there is, a, like, a historical account of, you know, and, again, like, all these kind of myth-building things that happen around all these kind of figures, you don't know how accurate all these historical accounts are. But there was a historical source that said that Wyatt Earp, like, walked across the water face, facing down all these bullets and killed Curly Bill. Like, right. that's... Um, yeah, a thing that happened, yeah. apparently. Which I know, um, it pops up in, I know it's the Coen Brothers True Grit, they mentioned it as well, of that, um, I can't, Jeff Bridges, he, he talks about charging, that you do the charge directly at them or something. I forgot the whole lines, but they get so, if you're charging directly at them, firing, they get so freaked out about it and because of whatever that, you almost have a better chance. I don't know how he, I mean, <laughs> I mean obviously the Coen brothers phrase it a lot better than I am right now <laughs> because, but yeah. So I wonder if that was taken from those accounts too. Of Possibly. Like if, you, if you have that kind of madness in you or that like no, or no fear of death, if you almost, you frighten them more so that they're more likely to miss. Yeah. No, I've never stared down a gun down in Yeah, time. me neither. <laughs> no, no, neither have I. So like, um, like, uh, I have no. I'll take your word for it, Craig. Yeah. I have no I, point, so I, I have yeah. no point of reference here. So, yeah. um... <laughs> I don't think any, uh, any of us are going to be in one of those positions, but that I'll is just, true. yeah, go off of the, the true grit. <laughs> Whatever Jeff Bridges says, I'm like, okay, yeah, why not? Yeah. We'll take we'll take Jeff Bridges' word for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah. So like again, uh, maybe we're kind of following the history a little bit. They're kind of 
it, they're really strictly following the history in some ways and not following the history at all in other ways. Yeah. It's, it's, I get, again, it's kind of weird, but it's fine, fair. Um, but cinematically, it does feel weird that Curly Bill kind of dies here. Yes. Uh, mm. right. I, I suppose that really there's no out and out sort of top boss, is there? No. Throughout the entire film, you sort of go from, you know, Ike, piece of shit, to, um, Thomas Hayden Church at OK Corral, to Curly Bill, to Johnny Ringo, you know, it sort of passes between whoever's in the vicinity doing something wrong at the time. Yeah. Mm. Under the guise of Curly Bill being the top dog, but it's a cowboy gang, so it's not, it's not like, um, Eli Wallach's character in, uh, in the, Magnificent Seven, Magnificent where he Seven. is, yeah, he is the top dog. You can see that he is the man that that pulls all the strings. Yeah, it's okay. not sort of that sort of thing. It's sort of like, yeah, he's the top guy, but these other guys do what they're all independent of him. So yeah, it's it's a weird, it's a weird one because there's no out and out big bad. Like you know, as you guys have watched all those Seagal films, there's always a big bad in that. Yeah. It's like an arcade game. You start with a little fry and work your way up to the top. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, where in this it's sort of, it's moving in about. You could kill like a third in command ten minutes into the film. You know, this, it feels like that sort of film, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that, yeah that effort. And, um, no, well, then we get, I don't know, because it's just, it is interesting, like you were saying, Wayne, with the whole, it, it feels, and especially with the script and so much cut out of it, I wonder if it's something that would have, by today's standards, almost have been more of like a miniseries or what would have, you mm. know, something like Deadwood, where it was just like, here is the account from the, you know, the timeline from beginning to yeah, and because even there's po- a point at the OK Corral where he tells um, the the sheriff that he's not going to arrest them today or whatever. And there is that moment, it you know, I wrote down, I you know, didn't mention it that like, oh, the movie could have just ended right here almost. Yeah, it could and, have. Been. Yeah, but they just, you know, it keeps going of kind of telling these accounts. But yeah. And then we get Jason Presley kind of having his big moment that doesn't mean anything and it's undeserved because <laughs> Billy Zane, who again, we haven't really had too many scenes with or anything or again, all this stuff. He's just yeah he's no like, he pops up like twice before <laughs> yeah. his death he, he, yeah. but that's you know like he, he doesn't have much of a much of a role in it, in it at all um, he, maybe yeah, because I am a wrestling that. fan I did put in my notes uh, Priestley turns face after death of Zane yeah <laughs> well and there's the monologue about him wanting to bring something of beauty he was beautiful yeah. and he was trying to bring some beauty into your horrible world or whatever and yeah again. Like, oh, yeah, that guy who we saw an hour ago. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's Henry V is still emblazoned in all our minds. That's it. The the bit I didn't get here is, so after Curly Bill's, no, just before that, isn't it? All these cowboys have been sworn as as marshals, haven't they? Yeah. uh, Yes, by the the, the, sheriff, isn't it? It's got to be by, um, I forgot the sheriff's name. What's the sheriff's name? Behan. Yeah, piece of shit. That's the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because you see them charging at them, or not charge. I don't know. There's that scene where they they look through the telescope and see the whole group riding mm-hmm. their way, and then you just never. They don't deal with that again. That's when they run over to um Charlton Heston's house yeah. or something. Doc Doc Holliday gets um worse, doesn't he? Because he's been riding yeah. with them, and he's uh his tuberculosis is getting the better of him. Yeah. Yeah. And um. Yeah, and because of, I guess, coincidence, she shows up as well at the ranch. Mm. At, at <laughs> Nested's ranch. I've just put in my notes here, more of the hokey romance. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I know you were saying, Wayne, you wanted to talk more about Heston. Or, oh, you know. uh, the uh, acting piece of wood, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that uh, you say there's an hour and 30 minutes on the floor. I'm assuming that the, the 15 minutes of that is Charlton Heston delivering one of his lines. Because uh, it sounds anybody could have played. You know, like he plays that moment in, in Wayne's World. where Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's done for laughs. And it's like, oh, he's got a bit of dramatic gravitas. In this, I think he forgets that he can actually dramatically act. Because it's like anybody could have played this role. Yeah. Anybody. Mm-hmm. Give it to somebody who cares. It's like... I almost feel like it's oh I've got a I've got this gig um yeah I'm I'm going and acting in this new um 
Kurt Russell Val Kilmer film about uh, Wyatt Earp and uh, Doc Holliday. Are oh, you really? Yeah, I really have. I call away. I call away. He gets there and he's got two lines of script and he's like, "Fuck this! I'm just cashing the paycheck. Yeah. Whatever, you know. Oh yeah, we'll look after him." Sorry, I could have done it. Just you know, age me <laughs> up a bit, stick me on stage. I could have done it. No worries. <laughs> so, and the the two vintage actors in this are a bit strange to me. So you get Charlton Heston and Robert Mitchum. Neither of them have a massive background in Wild West films. It's like, well, we just need somebody from old Hollywood. Who have we got? Well, let's get these two guys. One of them did like sci-fi films and um, <clears throat> some um, epic um, biblical films. And yeah. the other did loads of film noir. So let's get them into this historical Western. <laughs> yeah. It makes no sense. Yeah, it is kind of funny because like, I was kind of thinking that as well. It was like, you know, you were saying earlier, Wayne, you know, when you think Val Kilmer, what film do you think of? Yeah. And I was, you know, and I was like, oh, well, this film would be near the top of the list. And it's like, when I think Charlton Heston, I think like Ten Commandments. Yeah. You know, when I think Robert Mitchum, I think like Night of the Hunter. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> those, those great Western films. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it would have been great for, they should have got, I don't know, there's like, um, as you were talking about, Wayne, like there's Rory Calhoun, there's, who was alive, you know, I know that he was alive during that time. There's all these kind of different yeah, I'm trying, tons I'm of different to, actors yeah. who were still alive before then. Exactly. There's, there's. Right. I'm just trying to, you know, you got Eli Wallach was still alive at this point. Yeah. You could have got him to come and deliver these lines. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, in a push, I suppose you could have tried for Clint if you really wanted some gravitas to your film. I don't think Clint would have done it off the back of, you know, a year off the back of um, Unforgiven. But you got people who have got a history of, of Wild West films. So why go and pick these two? It's, it's a bit... And it almost feels like they're playing it as, oh, these guys, you know, back in the day, they were in Hollywood films. It's like, yeah, but they weren't in Westerns. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing in this, other than being, you know, an acting block of wood. At one point, I did actually think, why have they put that beam in the middle of the door and it was John <laughs> Heston. <so. laughs> uh, yeah. 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 No, he's not great. Um, um, I, yeah, it's a totally throwaway cameo. Um, that's, that's just, that is just there. Um, but the plot continues as McMaster, who's played by Michael Rooker, um, is, is dead. He's just thrown, uh, yeah. thrown down. His yeah. dead body is kind of thrown at them at the ranch. And, um, they're kind of, the, one of Ringo's guys delivers a message to Wyatt that, like, um, meet him at, I think it's like Oak Hill or something. Or, yeah. Um, I, you know, when he wants to face mano a mano for, for a gun duel. And, um, he accepts. Um, yes. But not before uh, talking to Doc about it. Which Doc gives the whole, <laughs> he wants revenge for being born. That's the <laughs> type of man Ringo is. And that, um, yeah, Wyatt is basically, Wyatt knows he can't beat Ringo. And Doc even confirms it of saying he won't beat Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like your friends to back you up, is the... <laughs> yeah. But Doc has other plans because he asks about what's it like wearing that badge and, you know, he's doing all that. Yeah. <laughs> Which you're like, oh, well, he's on his deathbed, and so I'll just give him this badge. And But no, Doc still has a few tricks up his sleeve because they ride out, they meet the gang, and they basically say, well, Ringo's just down the path, which Wyatt treks alone, but then we assume that, um, yeah, walking up to Ringo, and Ringo assumes, too, that it is Wyatt Earp, but no, it is Doc Holliday. Dun, dun, dun. Of the, <laughs> the others, yeah, so basically the two most famous scenes in this movie are between Ringo and Val Kilmer, or, or, you know, Ringo and Doc Holliday. Because he says some, what he, he does again, the I'm your Huckleberry, and then you can see the fear in Ringo's eyes, and he's yeah. like, well, I don't, ha I'm not, I don't wanna, he's kind of stuttering of like, this isn't with you, Doc. He's like, no, we have a game we started a long time ago for blood. It's really well done that. Yeah, it's an excellently done scene, this one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Again, historically accurate, they're about three feet apart from yeah. each other. And they're just sort of circling each other. It almost looks like they're about to bullfight each other, doesn't it? It's really, it's really well handled. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I just love, so finally, you know, they're, Doc is 
cuff and he's all calm like he has been the whole time. And once they shoot and he gets him in the head and you see Ringo doing that like weird, you know, because he's been shot in the head, that dance thing of like he's firing the gun and Doc is just yelling, come on. And then he even insults him. He's like, oh, you, I forgot. What does he say now? It's like, you were just, uh, don't have it. I forgot to write it down. Or he's yelling, come on, and he's... Um, yeah, I remember the, the come on, come on, and he's kind of dancing around him, but I can't but remember he lays, when, he, yeah. when he lies down and he kind of cradles him. Uh, like, I can't remember like, Does he say something he like, um, is it say something like, you even die poorly, or something like that? Yeah. Something like it's that. Not, yeah, it's basically saying he he was just all... Sh- in some way, it's like, oh, you're just all show. You're just... I, I don't know, something like I can't remember. I'll remember it when we... <laughs> Stop yes. filming. Basically, it was, a, it was a suggestion that he was all talk all along. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that scene, I mean, that is kind of one of those, it's one of those moments where it just, it oddly makes the movie. Like, all the problems you have with it, like, their scenes together. Like, if you just had a movie that was Doc Holliday and Ringo and this, you know, <laughs> kind of showing their, the struggle leading up to it, I mean, I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then well, after that duel, that 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 well done duel. Um, and next in my notes, I've just put more riding and yep. killing because yeah. we get another montage yeah. of just indiscriminate killing of people who we are, as the audience presume, are evil people and need to yeah. be wiped out the world. Yeah, and our uh, and Wayne's favorite guy. <laughs> oh, Stephen Lang, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's still. He, he doesn't even die. He just throws his uh, sash he, off. He exactly, he rips and the then, sash off in in this sort of like and doing that high pitch thing he does. Yeah. So it's the the last the last charge of Voyager Earth and his immortals, and you're like, he's yeah. gonna get him. He's gonna. He rips it off and he puts the gun away. No, just just pretend you're still holding it and put a bullet yeah. in your brain. It's <laughs> all a favor. Yeah. But no. Like, yeah, um, if you. They could, it, you know, it was back then. You didn't have anything. They could have just done it, but they just hold on to that honor code of like, well, it's off. I guess he's gonna do some more horrible stuff, but it's not our problem anymore. No. Yeah. But yeah, that um, kind of leads us to the Doc and Wyatt final scene. So, yeah. you know, we've seen Doc basically laying sick in bed, recurring throughout, but this is the the final. <laughs> Doc and yeah. this is his actual deathbed. Yeah, yeah. Why it walks in just after he's received last rites, isn't he? Yeah. And it's like I don't think Doc Holliday is a religious man, but fuck it, he'll take it anyway. Yeah. Well, well, Doc even makes the comments about it, saying like, "Oh, we were just talking about the mysteries of <laughs> the Catholic Church or something," and then saying my. My hypocrisy knows no bounds, but then Wyatt <laughs> says, I don't think you're a hypocritical man. I think you just like to pretend to be or something. And yeah, this kind of has the, it's a we- so it's this weirdly sentimental moment that I think works better than the rain melodrama scene. Oh, yeah. I think this works yeah. way better. I, I do, I do feel the emotion of this scene. I know like when like uh, Doc Holiday is saying, you know, like, um, you know, like live every second, live life up yeah. to the hill, live for me. Like yeah. I, I did feel the emotion of that. Yeah. I do feel like this uh, scene has appropriate weight. Yeah. Of him saying, if you're, if you're my friend, then the best thing you can do right now is just go because that's what, you know, and all this stuff. And you know, that, that part actually is kind of like what it gets you. It choked up and you see, because as you were saying, Wayne, like throughout it, you were watching him kind of deteriorate and he's getting more and more pale. And this is just, even by this end, yeah. you see the I mean, sweat and how pale he is. And it's going back hard. to Val Kilmer's acting again. Yeah. Not only is he smashing all these fantastic lines and doing all of that brilliant, you know, dragging your eye to him. He's also having to deal with trying to pretend that he's got tuberculosis. Yeah. You know, and he's doing all of that. He's can completely convincing as a character. Well, in this scene, like reading about the the behind the scenes, like he went pretty method. He's not doing yeah. that much acting. So in this he death scene, he is li- <laughs> he's he's on a bed of ice. Um, oh, wow. um to try <laughs> Because he wanted to experience something as close to uh, the the experience of dying <laughs> as possible. So yeah, he's he's going pretty hardcore method in this one. Oh jeez, wow, that's Actors. crazy. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> well, I know. You know, speak, yeah, speaking <laughs> speaking of the doors, that was another thing. Is that he went like full method 
with Jim Morrison for the Doors one. I don't remember. Yes, he did yes, a bunch did. of stuff that went yeah way overboard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that that kind of sickly pallor is um, not just all makeup. Okay. That's <laughs> him literally freezing his ass off. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah. No, I. I mean, this scene. I think it kind of, for the sake of this movie and what we've witnessed between him and Doc, I think it kind of is a nice kind of wrap up. And you could almost even end there, but he brings them the book that he wrote about. It's like my friend, um, Doc yeah. Holliday. And then you get I that, feel like this yeah. would have been the perfect yeah. ending scene. Like, I definitely feel like you could have ended the movie here. Yeah. yeah, I agree completely. And you even have, which I think it's suggested kind of that Doc Holliday sees a light or something because he's like, as he's dying, he says the, it's like a little joke to himself of like, oh, damn, or mm. whatever. there's some sort of, mm-hmm. I don't know, something that is going on in his head that is supposed yeah, to harken back. I took back it to, as yeah. um, sort of, it's an old saying, isn't it, when you die, your toes curl. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. he's looking at his feet, isn't he? Yeah. But he's yeah. never mentioned it in the film once. Yeah. Piece that together, so I'm I'm feel like I'm just barking up the wrong tree completely. That's that right. Yeah, work. you could be right though. Yeah. Like I, I think that's, that's, that's right. a good show. It's a, yeah, it's the strange one that is. Yeah, but no, we don't get that as a great ending. We get him going to see, you know, her, and then you know to let it be known that he doesn't have a lot of money. But she's like, "Don't worry, my family's rich." And then they decide right. to dance. So this scene snow. annoys me because I've written in my notes right. Um, the, that romance we all care about is finally consummated. Um, and then I've put capitalism wins because it's just, it's just like, that's okay. My family's rich. And it's like, oh, that's convenient to the plot. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so they dance in the snow and then we get just more exposition, um, well, like more, you know, Robert Mitchum telling kind of what yeah. happened. I, or, yeah. After the fact. Is it Randolph Scott? Cried at um no he's not Randolph Scott is it but somebody yeah. cried at Wyatt's funeral so he, yeah. he lived to a, a grand old age because films were being made when um when he he, yeah, he died so he must that's right been... yeah he died in nineteen twenty nine apparently yeah a bunch of the early cowboy actors and uh, John Ford and uh, a bunch of Hollywood people knew the actual real Wyatt wow that's that's, that's, that's that's incredible we learned that Ike was killed at a what, a bank robber, or he tried to rob a bank or something a couple of years later and he was killed. Good uh, night, Stephen Lang, you yeah. utter piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that ending, I don't know, because it's, it's like you have such a powerful scene with Doc Holiday. And I just, especially th- watching it this time, I hated that ending. Mm-hmm. I just felt so, I was like, Oh, come on. Why are you doing this to me? But yeah, I think it's made more cheesy by the fact it's at Christmas as well. It's just yeah. randomly at Christmas <laughs> yeah. and they're dancing in the snow. It's just like oh, this just feels unnecessary. Yeah, I, th- I think they didn't want because the film is quite you know it's it's back and forth and as we've stated it's morally ambiguous. But you get to the end and if you end it where you know there's no two ways about it now. If this film was made in 2021, that would be your ending where Doc Holliday. Yeah. That would mm-hmm. be your ending, and you get Robert Mitchum come over and talk over the credits and whatnot. As you see, black and white images of Wyatt Earp and all the rest of them. That's what it'd be. But because I think they were like, this film is really dour, and we need to have Wyatt Earp have a happy ending, and we need some, you know, semblance of happiness in the world. It's not all doom and gloom. I think that's why they shoehorned it in. It's not needed at all. Mm. It's, it's just there. To give Wyatt and, and Josephine this happy ending. They could have set it up earlier in the film, uh, for them to be together. But it's sort of like, eh, we, we just need it to be. So, <laughs> so there is life in the world afterwards. You know, it's not all gunshots and, uh, dead cowboys. Yeah. No, I, it makes sense. I think especially, um, I mean, as we've kind of all said, I know Scott, you were saying in the very beginning of like making it more of a, that fun, like a, more of a, theater movie you know for all audiences mm, yeah. <laughs> where it's like you know you have the love story you have the whatever so it appeals to everybody <laughs> yeah, yeah i i think so i think so for sure and um it like 
you know, the, the, the movie kind of goes back and forth on how morally ambiguous it wants to be. It goes back and forth on how uh, much weight it wants to give to the violence. It goes back and forth of whether, it, how serious a movie it is or how popcorny a movie it is. It, I, it's very confused a lot of the time, but it is, it is an entertaining watch in, in the end. Um, and it does, it goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is a very entertaining. I had at no point in, during this film that I look at the time or think, oh, you know, better get off to bed or whatever. It was like, yeah, I'm glued to this. I'm, in, I'm, really, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's a good western. Uh, yeah, and you know, for and, and not every movie that is this movie's 130 minutes. You know, like um, some movies that are that length really, really drag, and um, this movie doesn't. It romps no. along for its uh, 130 minutes, uh, flaws yeah. and all. So. Like, um, we have talked fully about the movie. We've covered all of the movie. Uh, but before we head on out, um, do either of you want to give any kind of final thoughts that you've got on Tombstone? We'll go to you uh, first, Wayne. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, Stephen Lang isn't a piece of shit. He's a <laughs> remarkable actor who I think portrays Ike fantastically to the point where I think Ike is a massive piece of shit and it's so well done by Stephen Lang. It's obviously just for a good uh, comedic effect. But yeah, Stephen Lang does this character, infinite douchebaggy justice. And he, for me, is one of the all time douchebag characters, uh, in any film possible. He's just an absolute twat. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all, that's my entire final thought, really, to be honest. Excellent. Excellent. You and you're entirely correct. He plays a genuinely infuriating shit heel coward super well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Craig, final thoughts? No, I think, like, as I said before, I think there are some issues you could see, obviously. The, you know, the script had a lot cut, especially when you're analyzing it like this or we're going scene by scene, but it is, you know, it's a fun watch. It, I can understand why it's a classic. And again, ev- as we've talked about, everybody does a good job with what they're given. And I mean, you watch it mainly for, as we've said many times, <laughs> I, I, I'd rec- I usually recommend it for anybody to watch it just for the sake of, you know, Val Kilmer and, um, Michael, um, I lost track of his name. Um, Michael Bain. And yeah, yeah I, I mean, for that alone, I'd recommend watching at least once, but yeah, it definitely has some issues that <laughs> make it a little more older and outdated than it could have been in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is just our thoughts on Tombstone. Uh, please uh, do come in with your comments, with the, with your reviews. Tell us um, what you think about Tombstone. Tell us what you think we got right, what you think we got wrong. If you, you know, if you think uh, we were misguided on some things, whatever it is, just give us your feedback. That'd be cool. But uh, before we head on out, um, uh, I just want to ask Wayne, like, uh, could tell tell the people, tell our audience where they can find your podcast. Tell us uh, where we can find you on social media. Uh, give, give, promote away, my man. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so I am from the One Pound Movie Podcast. Uh, it's a podcast where I search for films that cost one British pound or less. Oh. Could be anything. Could be Oscar winners. Could be B-movie trash. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook. On Twitter, it's uh, at One Pound Movie. Uh, I'm at One Pound Movie Podcast. On Facebook, just put One Pound Movie Podcast into into Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Spotify, Deezer. I'm not many places, to be honest. I haven't promoted the podcast as, as hard as I should have. Uh, as I was saying to Craig off air, this is a side project from another podcast I do. So, um, which is the You Haven't Heard This Music podcast, which is all about unheard music and uh, little heard uh, bands and artists. So you can find me on both of those Um Please like, subscribe, all that jazz. You know, you know what to do. And talking about knowing what to do, Craig, give us the regular plugs. Oh, yep. Um, I also co-host the podcast Bloodhound Picks, which we will either highlight basically indie or obscure artists or older films from the within the horror community. And yeah, recently we just did a couple horror comics too because people reached out to us for that, which should be coming up, I think, this month or next, depending on when it's 
that specific. Uh, not, not like, um, yeah. like remember, remember, this is the Kurt Russell season, uh, Craig. Yes. So this <laughs> is now September. Oh, yep. Never mind that. <laughs> so you will have already heard them if you decide to listen to it. <laughs> um, no, uh, but besides that, yeah, just Craig Dram on Twitter or Instagram or any of those or Bloodhound Picks, which is P I X on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. All the social media things, as always. And if you want to check out my other podcast, you can. Uh, it's New Horror Express. Um, I, you know, talk to indie horror movie directors and sometimes actors and sometimes novelists. And uh, we do something kind of similar to this where we cover guilty pleasure horror movies once a month as well. Um, but in terms of this podcast, you can always hit us up on our Twitter at 90s underscore all. And uh, you can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, a bunch of other places where you, you can get your podcasts. Please do rate, review, and subscribe to us. And if you do review us, please, please, please give us five stars because otherwise the algorithm will tell us we are terrible and we don't think we're terrible. So five stars or nothing, folks. That's what we got. Anyway, we got to head on out now and um, join us again next week when we will be covering Stargate. Until then, though, see ya.